and recognition of guests, the Honourable Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, happy Wednesday. And uh, I'd like to say hi to everyone in District 8 and uh, my aunt Georgina in the Prince County Hospital. Hello. Uh, welcome the guests in the gallery. I see Barb Rookins from the Nurses Union and former MLA, Michelle Bean. It's nice to see you. And welcome all our other guests. And uh, Madam Speaker, as you're aware, the holiday season is upon us. If you, uh, I don't know about your calendar, but ours are filling up with uh, invitations to uh, functions over the next few weeks. And uh, one of my favorites is the Women's Institute Yuletide Gala, which is tomorrow night, Madam Speaker. And I know uh, you've attended before, and it's it's quite a fundraiser, and uh, it's a great event, and it's at the Delta tomorrow night. So I'd like to wish the Women's Institute uh, a huge success tomorrow evening. Also, Madam Speaker, I uh, was able to attend the uh, PI Potato AGM this morning, Madam Speaker, and give greetings to the potato farmers on a Seems like a pretty successful year. Uh, all the numbers aren't in yet, but uh, pretty good. Uh, I want to say thank you to a couple of retiring directors of the board, uh, Jason Hayden and Chad Robertson, Madam Speaker. They've served their time and are stepping away, and uh, welcome the new, the new board members for that. And uh, with that, Madam Speaker, our roads are we're in great shape this morning. I want to give the Minister of Transportation and his crew a big <laughs> applaud because uh, he was criticized yesterday, but I'm going to say that roads were tremendous today. So uh, with that, Madam Speaker, when you're on the roads, be, be mindful of uh, the changing conditions and take your time. There's never a big rush, but uh, thank you and enjoy the proceedings. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome those who are watching online and those who are in the gallery today from the representatives from the PI Nurses uh, Association, uh, Barb, Stephanie and Michelle. Nice to see you back, Michelle. Um, and just one thing I, that I was uh, scrolling through on, on Facebook uh, early this morning and I saw that um, the Santa's Angels had put a post out. And uh, so up until December the 12th, they're going to receive uh, applications, I guess, for families or individuals in need. Um, and the Santa Angels is a group that travels right across Prince Edward Island um, and they, on Christmas morning, and they deliver presents and foods to uh, those who are in need. And so it's a great program. I did participate in it, I participated in the past with it. And just to uh, see the surprise when Santa, you know, knocked on the door and had a, a treat for them was just something that, that actually made my Christmas. So I hope uh, anyone out there who feels uh, the need to please apply online uh, on the Santa Angels uh, webpage. Um, and uh, for anybody that would like to donate to that program, um, I'm sure they would also welcome that. So with that, Madam Speaker, I wish everyone a great day in, in the House. <coughs> The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to welcome back all my colleagues, including the pages today, Campbell, Gage, and Evelyn. I'd like to welcome the people in the gallery here from PEI Nurses Union, and uh, of course, um, all of the people in the gallery today. Thank you for being here. Um, and everyone tuning in from across the island, and especially to those in Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Um, this weekend, I know, as was mentioned, um, Things are filling up, calendars are filling up, there's all kind of, kinds of really fun events happening all across the island. And this Saturday is the one of my favourites, the Indigenous Artisans Christmas Market, uh, being held from 10 to 5 at the Confederation Centre of the Arts. Um, there's over 50 Mi'kmaq artisans from across Epiquit who will be there uh, sharing their incredible talent and craftsmanship. Admission is free and you can expect to see beautiful quill work, painting, beaded, jewellery, baskets, Christmas decorations, apparel, books and much more. And uh, Madam Speaker, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Sally Bernard from Barnyard Organics uh, in Bedeck, has been chosen as a 2024 Newfield Canada Scholar. Um, in the agriculture community, Newfield is a scholarship that awards successful applic applicants funds to travel the world exploring a specific topic related to agriculture and bring information back to their country. And Sally's topic is on managed grazing in a cropping rotation, particularly under organic or regenerative practices. This week she'll travel to Regina and then in March to Brazil to meet the other scholars 
scholars from around the world who are doing the same project, followed by 10 weeks of international travel the next two years to study her chosen topic. And anyone who knows Sally knows how passionate she is about farming, what a brilliant, strong advocate she is for farming practices, especially in this era of climate change. She's uh, uh, a force to be reckoned with as she passionately uh, tries to keep farming very a strong force uh, in the province. And the scholarship is sponsored by the PEI Department of Agriculture. So I would just like, to, I'm sure all of us in here would wish her the best on that very exciting project. And I look forward to seeing what she brings back to us to share with us here. And just one last quick point, Santa's Angels. I, when I was a school counselor, I worked diligently with Santa's Angels too. And, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them and all the other organizations who are t using their time, resources, and gathering uh, every, uh, everybody else's times and resources to make Christmas a little brighter for people who could use it. So just thank you to everyone doing that work, and Santa's Angels is an incredible example of that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good afternoon to all the viewers at home and to all the residents of District 1, Surrey, Elmira. Madam Speaker, while I'm on my feet, I would like to acknowledge the good work of the staff from the Department of Housing, Lands and Communities. Madam Speaker, helping Islanders in housing needs can be challenging at the best of times, but when you are able to help, it can make all the difference in the world to that person. Madam Speaker, last week I became aware of an emergency housing situation in my district with a constituent. I connected that individual with the department, and I am pleased to report that the matter was able to be resolved successfully. I later got a message from the individual thanking the staff for their assistance, and I could tell you that it was uh, a positive uh, difference in their life with that decision. I know that the men and women who work in our government departments work very hard to help improve the lives of Islanders, and it's not always a thankful task. So today, I just want to extend thanks to the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities and his department for everything that they do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education and Early Years. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Welcome back to all my colleagues here in the House. Thank you to those who are attending here in the gallery, and hello to all those tuning in from across the island, um, but specifically in District 9, Charlottetown, Hillsborough Park, obviously the greatest district on PEI. Um, <coughs> Madam Speaker, uh, this is a busy week in island schools. Teachers across the province, they're working on their final assessments and starting to prepare for report cards. Parent-teacher interviews are happening on Thursday and Friday, so these are really two full days for our teachers, uh, yet a very important opportunity to connect with parents and guardians. And finally, Madam Speaker, this is also kindergarten registration week for the public schools branch. So if your child is eligible to start kindergarten next September, this is the week to get them registered, either by going online to your school's website or by contacting the school administration directly. It's important, of course, for families to register for kindergarten so that we can properly prepare and plan for the next year. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't get up to do greetings um, much, but I'll um, start off and welcome everyone in the gallery. It's nice to see you. Um, secondly, to the residents of Stratford Keppoch, D6, um, thanks for tuning in. Um, and I'm getting up today because it's my mother's birthday, and to embarrass her, I'm going to do greetings today. Um, so happy birthday, Mom. <laughs> I won't sing. That would be <laughs> way more than what any of us can handle in here. Um, and then while I'm up here, I have to say um, hello to my grandmother, Rose Shivery, Nanny Rose, and a dear friend of our family, Annie Mae Mullally, that tunes in every day. So thank you. Uh -huh. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody to the proceedings today and everybody watching at home, especially those in District 21, Summerside, Wilmot. We all know what the greatest district is, but someone stole the thunder, so we won't use that today. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody out there know about the 44th annual swearing in of the junior mayor and council today in Summerside, or this evening, at 6.30 in council chambers. It's uh, my time on council. It was my favorite time to see the kids come in from the junior high and from the high school and come in and get sworn in. 
It's uh, a little, little different this year. My nephew's one of them. So, and also out there, uh, the deadline of the November the 27th is coming close for entering in the Santa Claus parade in Summerside. I uh, just want to make sure that we get as many floats in that parade as we can. It's always a great show and put on by the fire department. And one other thing I want to bring awareness to is a Summerside resident, Amy McFeely, who works out of school and she went out on her own to procure hockey gear for a, a couple young students. They secured some ice time so they can get on and try hockey and all that. So if anybody's out there has some extra hockey gear for young kids 10 to 12 years old, uh, reach out. I can get you in touch with her. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Pleasure to rise today. Bring greetings to the wonderful constituents of District 24, Evangeline Miscouche. Toujours un plaisir de se lever pour saluer les résidents à la circonscription Evangeline Miscouche. Je le fais pas souvent, mais je veux vraiment maintenir le fait que j'appuie leur support. J'apprécie leur support et leur leur appui dans le travail que je fais au niveau du district. I know that most of my constituents are busy with many different events or activities, especially when we are entering the most festive time of the year for a lot of people. But Madam Speaker, I would, be, I would like to commend the organizers and volunteers of last week's Christmas fair that took place at the Village Musical up in Abrams Village. Uh, my, many vendors and many shoppers took part in this wonderful fair. They had many vendors with fresh baked items and many artisans selling the most creative items. This year's fair was a real success, so congratulations to all that took part in that fair. Madam Speaker, I would also like to send a shout out to all the wonderful ladies and gentlemen uh, the, from the St. Philip St. Jake Parish Hall who are busy making over a thousand meat pies for their parish fundraiser. They do this activity every year and if they had more time and more hands, uh, they could sell even more. But a huge congratulations goes out to them for taking the time every year to do this and to take this task on. And Madam Speaker, they're among the best meat pies on PEI. <laughs> Also, a huge hello to Paul and Ernest Gallant of St. Raphael. They are faithful watchers of the legislative uh, proceedings. Uh, the Premier had the honour of meeting them uh, during our campaign in April, and they were very grateful for his visit. Paula has been living with cancer for a number of years now, but she is the most positive person that I know. Keep going, Paula, you're a real trooper. So I'd like to say hi, a special hi to Paula and Ernest, who I know are watching today, and also to my aunt Irene, who is uh, a faithful watcher of the Legislative Assembly. And last but not least, uh, my last uh, shout out goes out to the Club Richelieu Evangeline, which is a, a group of individuals that do a lot of fundraising and they do support youth groups throughout the, uh, the province, and they were able to uh, share about over $15,000 in the last couple of weeks with different youth groups uh, throughout this province. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I too would like to welcome everybody in the gallery, Barb and Stephanie and Michelle from the PEI Nurses Union, and of course everybody else. So lovely to see you all here. And uh, I would also, at risk of being taunted into singing, also, like the Minister of Finance, want to wish my son, Dan, a happy birthday today. Uh, Dan uh, turns 30 today. Actually, my baby turns 30 today, Madam Speaker. And uh, he happens to be home on the island at the moment. He lives in Toronto, but he's here today. And he's having lunch with his big brothers. Uh, Some are probably made Marians, I would guess, but I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, happy birthday to you, Dan. You're much loved, and it's lovely to have you here at home. Um, also, th today is National Housing Day, and uh, at the end of the day, I think it was last week, and uh, we'd had a rough day, uh, and somebody in our office, who shall remain nameless but sits right in front of me, said, um, you know, that was a difficult day, but I'm going home now. I'm going home to my house now. And imagine if you were having a rough day and you had nowhere to go home to. And I don't know why, but it was a moment when that really st struck home uh, to me. And I, you probably many of you who came into the house today noticed that somebody had written homeless on the pathway on the way into the legislature here. And I think we sometimes forget in our privilege that being able to go home offers us a sense of stability and, and physical stability to deal with all of life's challenges. And 
if you are without a home. Uh, it just makes life so very, very difficult. And housing is not just a basic right. It's absolutely essential to our well-being. And so on this National Housing Day, I'd like us all just to pause for a minute and, and remember those who are without homes and, and what an incredible challenge that places on them day after day after day. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Restico Emeralds. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all my colleagues back here, huh? as well as those in the gallery. Nice to see you. And, of course, everyone watching from District 18, Restico Emerald. Uh, and uh, today, uh, Madam Speaker, I was at the, the funeral of Reverend Barb Wagner, and it was a really beautiful celebration of life with some great music. I was privileged to, to sing in the choir, and, re and I reconnected with some people I hadn't seen in a long time. Uh, one of them was, uh, was George Mason, um, and uh, he's, he's a, a, a person with a lot of knowledge. And one of the things he's always said is that our Father who art in heaven or our Father which art in heaven. So that's something perhaps I can refer to the uh, Legislative Assembly staff for the, the, the grammar on that one, but he claims it's which. But uh, Madam Speaker, at the funeral, um, Mark Douglas uh, was there, a constituent of mine who plays the pipes, and he just did a fantastic job uh, again today. And uh, I was speaking of pipers, uh, Madam Speaker. I wanted to talk about Dancing with the Stars this year. I know a member from Charlottetown, Winslow, has danced with the stars in the past, as have I, as has uh, Peter Ben Baker, and, or sorry, New Haven Rocky Point. I'm sorry about that, um, Madam Speaker. Um, and so this year, um, there were a couple of constituents, Susan Doucette, who did a fantastic job with a very colorful costume and dance uh, from District 18, and Peter McDougall, who's also a piper, Madam Speaker, he did a fantastic job. But I should mention that Eric McPhail, who was, of course, Anne Zakem's son, uh, my girlfriend, Eric <laughs> McPhail got the Judge's Choice Award, which is basically winning the event. So I wanted to congratulate him officially on the record. And, of course, together they raised tens and tens of thousands of dollars for Hospice PEI, such a great organization. Um, and Ma Madam Speaker, I also wanted to, uh, to recognize the Piper's Ryan and Sarah Simpson. So at the Remembrance Day ceremony, of, of course, uh, Piper's are a, a staple both in North Rustico and Cavendish. Uh, Matt McLean does an amazing job in North Rustico every year. Um, either Ryan or Sarah plays in, at Cavendish on the cliffs overlooking the water, usually a stiff breeze, and Sarah did a fantastic job this year. But, uh, Madam Speaker, they also did a presentation in at the Visitor Centre, Canadian Pipers and Pipe Tunes on the Western Front. So this was a lecture and a bagpipe recital. And uh, I didn't catch all of it, but uh, it's incredible. So I'd encourage anybody uh, here that if you want to have that come to your district, just reach out to them. And lastly, Madam Speaker, Thank you for bearing with me. Um, one of the favorite uh, hockey organizations for the member from Charlottetown Belvedere, the Mid-Isle Matrix were at the, uh, the Monctonian uh, uh, last weekend, and they did very well across the front. My son was playing on the U15 team. They finished 1-1-1, one, one, and one, but narrowly lost in that one tie and almost made the quarterfinals, which is, is, a, is a big accomplishment. But the Western Rebels, they were tied for fourth out of 12 teams. That's the new U16 team on the island in that organization. And the Kensington Wild, Madam Speaker, went right to the semifinal uh, and, and lost a, had a narrow loss there. So kudos to them and uh, that great hockey organization. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our member's not going to need his member statement today. <laughs> <laughs> the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, welcome to those uh, joining us in the gallery this morning and those watching from District uh, 23, Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, especially uh, Shirley MacArthur, who seems watches every day, she, I was told. Uh, also, Madam Speaker, on the way down, I stopped in to wish uh, Marjorie Summers of uh, Traveler's Rest a very happy 100th birthday. But she must have been out celebrating, I guess, though she wasn't at home, but <laughs> so I'll just say happy birthday, Marjorie. <laughs> the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and the Government Whip. Yeah, th thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I do want to recognize uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. When I was in Dancing with Stars, the member actually beat me, so <laughs> much better dancer. Um, I do want to recognize uh, a business uh, in District 10, Shaw's Towing, 
which you probably don't want to be recognizing them because you, I needed their services uh, last night. I was down uh, in uh, the Honourable uh, Environment Minister's uh, area uh, for a hockey practice uh, with four young ladies who were having a hockey practice and on the way back we blew a tire right in Cherry Valley. But uh, thank you to Sean who in moments or the very quick phone call uh, showed up and got me back to Winslow safe and sound. So I just wanted to thank Shaw's Towing and the great work that they do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And it's always uh, it's a pleasure to rise here this afternoon in the legislature and uh, uh, say hello, uh, shout out to everybody right across the province, but certainly the ones in District 26, Albert and Bloomfield, uh, the best district in PEI. <laughs> With that, though, I think it's always interesting that we hear so many ones in here stand up and refer to their district as the best. And that is as it should be, because it shows the pride and the honor that each one of us have in this legislature in representing the people in our, uh, uh, the residents in our area. Certainly want to uh, say hello to all the ones in the gallery here, uh, ones from the PEINU, always great to see you. Uh, last evening, uh, Madam Speaker, I had uh, the honor to attend this is a bit of a mouthful. The Canadian Technical Asphalt Association uh, meeting and banquet. And it's the first time that the CTAA has been hosted here in the province since 2006. Uh, at that time, uh, the Minister of Transportation was also from the western part of the province, Gail Shea. And it was interesting uh, that uh, speaking with ones from right across the country and attendees at uh, the CTAA, uh, there were ones there from the US, there were ones there from right across Canada. But the comment made was, uh, and they do have uh, this uh, conference every year, Madam Speaker, but that the only time that a Minister of Transportation in any area of the country has ever attended has been in Prince Edward Island back in 2006 and again last evening. And I also want to give a shout out to the staff from my department who were involved in the organization of the conference, uh, the feedback that I received from once again from right across the country and from the states was just that it was a fantastic event and that it was uh, organized so well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise, and I'd like to welcome everyone in the gallery today. Um, I'd like to welcome all those who are watching from all across the island, but especially from District 22. Um, I do would like to mention with Michelle here in the gallery, I did attend the Grand Families meeting last night in Cornwall, which was an honor for me to be there. Thank you for having me. It um, was lovely to meet those grandparents, but I've met them in the past. It was wonderful to see them again, and we had a lovely speaker there last night who was sharing her story as a grandchild <coughs> raised by her grandparents. And Anyway, it was a lovely evening, um, and so it was a pleasure to be there. But also, Madam Speaker, today is National Housing Day, a day to recognize work done and work that still needs to be done to improve access to safe and affordable housing for everyone in Canada. As the MLA for Summerside District 22, I'd like to take this opportunity to recognize Lifehouse Emergency Shelter and Transitional Housing in Summerside for all the wonderful work that they do. Because of their work, women and children seeking a safe shelter and transitional housing can find that right in Summerside <laughs> District 22. The service Lifehouse provides is very important for Prince County, and I would like to recognize the founders, Margie Fowler, Susan DeRosh, and the manager there now, Jody Sentner, <coughs> as well as Adam Binkley from the Summerside Boys and Girls Club, also known as the BGC Prince County, for all the hard work that they do. I'm proud to show off today the, house, uh, the Heroes of Housing t-shirt and thank them. 
Isn't it beautiful? This is from, I oh, I can't do that. <clears throat> Sorry, I, I was told I could. Yeah. Sorry, can't do that, Your Honor. I, I, er, <laughs> Madam thank Speaker, you. I apologize for that. I, I thought I could. But anyway, I'd like to thank the Boys and Girls Club of Summerside. And I'd like to thank the sponsors and the province of Prince Edward Island for their support on this project. Thank you very much. Well, members, I know you probably all want to be here till the new year. But uh, could we please limit our greetings to 45 seconds? Uh, there have been a number of people here who went over. If you have a lot to say, do it in a member statement or a minister statement, please. Uh, we do have work to do, and I'd like to see it uh, accomplished. And I'd also like to say District 4 is the very best district in PEI. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Questions by members for starting with responses to questions taken as notice. Oh, sorry, members, I did it again. Member statements. See, I'm going to cut them off today. The honorable member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And normally my member statements are pretty quick, and today I wrote a bit of a longer one, so I'm a little bit nervous. But <laughs> edit, edit. <laughs> I rise today to highlight um, Buns and Things Bakery, a local bakery in Charlottetown, formerly Sherwood. It began in 1987 with Robin Elaine Dubois. It started as a wholesale bakery supplying local restaurants and hotels with bread and other baked goods, but grew into a bakery that provided Buns and Things to all. A Sunday special always found its way to our table during Sunday dinner. Raising Three Boys found me to be a regular at Buns and Things. But not just me, Madam Speaker. I remember a time when one of Andrew's friends was visiting, and I was making cinnamon buns. We were in the kitchen chatting, and when this young boy informed me that his mom also made homemade cinnamon buns, her homemade cinnamon buns were picked up at Buns and Things. And Madam Speaker, she wasn't wrong. I always remembered when Alex and Luke spent their summers at Belvedere Golf Course. I would offer to make breakfast before they left. They declined. And when I growled about breakfast being the most important meal, they informed me that they eat at the golf course because they make the best toast. I was curious as to find out how to make the best toast when I discovered that the best toast was made because of the bread from Buns and Things, and that Buns and Things was the supplier of Belvedere Golf Course uh, bread. There would be many children in our communities that would share similar stories. In addition to baked goods, they offer a selection of pre-made meals and, and a deli counter with delicious homemade subs and sandwiches. In 2014, Rob and Elaine's son, Bill, returned to PEI to work in the family business. In 2017, Bill became an owner-operator after his parents' retirement from the business. Rob and Elaine opened the bakery in 1987 with hard work, <coughs> quality products, and a community focus. They grew this bakery into a thriving business and an icon in our community. Today, their son, Bill, continues with these same value values. He continues, continues to work hard and persevere through difficult times. He has expanded to open a second store, Cakes by Buns and Things. Bill has continued to be a strong supporter of our community. He understands the importance of giving back in many areas, as Bill is also the past president of the Chamber of Commerce and continues to sit on that board. I always knew that Buns and Things was a great product, Madam Speaker, but I am inspired from what I hear in the community. Their generosity is overwhelming. They support our local schools' breakfast programs, local charities, as well as non-for-profits. And those are just a few things that I know about. Times are difficult, Madam Speaker, but this community business has maintained its dedication to our community for over 36 years. And I can only hope that there is 36 more years to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Restico Emerald. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, starting with my nomination speech in the 2011 provincial election, I have been an advocate for telemedicine and using technology to allow remote primary care. When the previous administration finally brought forward the Maple Service, this was a huge step forward. So while canvassing during this year's spring election, I received great feedback from users of Maple, especially Young Island families, with or without a family doctor, that found it efficient and convenient as a primary care stepping stone. In particular, the ability for Maple to refer patients to in-person physician appointments when needed was working well. However, Madam Speaker, it seems that as the desire to use the Maple service has expanded, the ability to access it has declined. I had a constituent contact me recently who tried to access Maple unsuccessfully for four days in a row, being told each time, Maple has cancelled your consultation due to high volume. 
She eventually went to the emergency department and waited for seven hours to see a doctor and get the prescriptions she needed. Also, people with family doctors must still pay for access to Maple, even though our government promised that it would pay for access for all. Reportedly, the problems with Maple are due to the inability to call on doctors from other provinces, budget, and red tape. All very solvable, and I have faith that they will be solved soon under this minister's leadership. I still firmly believe that telemedicine will play a huge role in the future provision of both primary and secondary care, or specialist care, I should say, and I have introduced a motion to the Legislative Assembly to that effect. Audio and video consultation through services like Maple is just scratching the surface. Connected devices exist that allow for more fulsome examinations, and Islanders should have access to them as soon as possible to help solve our primary medical care crisis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. I rise today to bring attention to a matter of utmost importance that has been raised by a perceptive high school student within our province. This young individual has expressed compelling concerns regarding the mental health challenges faced by students within our schools. Ava Allen's insight shed a light into the pressing needs of increased attention around resources and support for mental health initiatives tailored to the unique experience of our island youth as we hear the voice of the next generation. It becomes imperative for this government to acknowledge and address mental health concerns affecting our students. Ava Allen is, a, is an island high school student who is part of Mr. Trainer's political studies class and gathering meaningful projects. As part of Ava's project, she shed her thoughts and insights about an important issue on PEI, the mental health of high school students. I'm going to read her words exactly as she provided them just last night. <coughs> on a, one emerging issue I see, I'm quoting, I see in Prince Edward Island is, the, is mental health issues in people in high school. The lack of support right now is an issue that keeps arising, is very concerning. Mental health issues are a significant concern for Prince Edward Island as they are everywhere. Many individuals struggling with anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. Unfortunately, there is perception that the supports available on PEI isn't meeting the needs of those who are affected. This can be due to a lack of resources, long wait times for therapy, a shortage of mental health professionals. Ava says, it's essential to continue advocating for improved mental health services and supports to ensure everyone who needs help can receive it. In my personal opinion, improving mental health supports could involve a few steps. We can increase the funds, which could help be able to hire more professionals to reduce wait times for therapy and provide resources for those struggling. It's also crucial to spread awareness of mental health issues so people are aware and don't feel alone. Ever since the pandemic started and ended, people are feeling more isolated and struggling more than ever. Even, without, even with modern technology at our fingertips, we still have people feeling alone and needing to be able to speak face to face about the issues. More care needs to be provided for people in need. Even creating support groups in the community or even high schools across the island for people my age or around the same age as my peers can have more supports in high schools. I would propose that you give these ideas serious thought and support a possible implementation target for this beginning in 2024." End quote. I ask the government to give serious consideration to Ava's recommendation and take steps to help them work through their many challenges they face every day. Thank you, Ava, for your important words. I am listening. End of member statements. Uh, <clears throat> questions by members, beginning with responses to questions taken as notice. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question for the Minister of Health. Everyone knows that our province is in the middle of a worsening crisis in mental health care. It's a challenge that affects every family or nearly every family on Prince Edward Island. And quite frankly, it's heartbreaking. I've met with many people who badly want their family member to get treatment. And yet, the care we should rely on just is not there. Yesterday, I asked the Minister about acceptable wait times for detox services. Of course, no answer. And frankly, I'm beginning to think that this government is worse than do nothing. I'm beginning to think that this government has no answers to the great 
challenges that we face here on Prince Edward Island. My question, are the current levels of service for community psychiatric services acceptable to this no answer minister? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, the member, for the question. Obviously, mental health is, is a big uh, is a big file, and, and we've done a few things over the last couple of years to improve services. Um, again, in talking with the department, those that are on the wait list, we do rec regularly check on them um, to ensure uh, when they're on the wait list how they're doing. So we, it's a constant monitoring of that of that wait list that we do have. Um, we do have lots of services, such as the, uh, the mental health walk-in clinics that, that are very effective that were stood up two years ago. So again, I would acknowledge that we continue to work on the mental health file and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. To the same no-answer minister. Are the current levels of service for community mental health services acceptable? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, Again, I guess it would, it, 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 uh, how to uh, say acceptable, it, it would be a, a judgment call on a lot of people. I knew, you know, again, we do have the intensive uh, mental health day program that we stood up this year in January, and we had 81 participants uh, take that program. It's very effective. It allows people to stay at home. Uh, during my tour, actually, they were the first booking at Hillsborough Hospital, and it was supposed to be a solution-based tour, but basically they just wanted to talk to us to tell us how effective it's been and, and to continue to do it and possibly look at expanding that program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So the facts are available. So if the no-answer minister is unwilling to provide information, I will do my best. So according to the most recent Health PI annual report, about one in five people are receiving community mental health services within a seven-day period. And that, Madam Speaker, seven-day period is the target set by Health PEI. Therefore, this minister is failing people and families who need community mental health services. More than 78% of the time, he is failing them. And it's a terrible performance, Madam Speaker. But even more, it's an absolutely tragic response to the heartbreak felt by so many. How can this no-answer minister justify such a poor and inadequate response to the very real needs that so many islanders who want help? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I think I'm doing a pretty good job answering these questions. Um, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's also important to recognize, although they continue to criticize the mobile mental health units about the volume that that uh, service is doing. I've mentioned it before in the House. Uh, my other um, counterparts in the other provinces are, were, were quite amazed that we were able to stand up that program and again service people, uh, especially after discharge that we follow up with over a thousand Islanders every year after they leave the hospital, which is uh, scientifically the most critical time to you know, maintain contact with these patients. So thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So another question that really was no response to a no answer from a no answer minister. And I said, my views on this government, Madam Speaker, are now shifting. I'm starting to realize that the do nothing approach of this government is due entirely to this government's inability to answer any of the challenges that we face here on Prince Edward Island. Maybe it's a lack of imagination, maybe it's an, an inability to truly uh, comprehend the challenges that we face. In 2022, 2023, Nearly 70% of Islanders seeking community psychiatric services were not helped within a seven-day period. And again, this is such a poor record, such a failure, so sadly that it hurts so many people across Prince Edward Island. Minister, how is this acceptable? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. Again, uh, making a listing of some of the things that we've done just in the last 24 months include the Intensive Mental Health Day program, the structured housing, expanded Lacey House, Emergency Storze Clinic, which is going to be open, and of course our mobile mental health. So I disagree. I think we're doing as much as we can on the mental health file. We'll continue to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, yesterday in question period, I had asked the Minister of Health questions surrounding the graduate nursing retention incentive bonuses. He couldn't tell us who had not received their payment, which I thought was rather astounding as a minister. But uh, later in that day, in a media scrum, he said his department provided them with numbers that they have the, down to single digits who have not got their bonuses yet. Minister, do you still stand by that statement that there's only been less than 10 graduates who have applied have not received their money? 
The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do appreciate the question. With a $987 million budget, I'm, I'm sure I can't uh, uh, give you an answer on every spend within health care, but again, um, in checking the numbers, it is about 18 people that we in it, but actually payday is today, so they're telling me that five or six will be dealt with. Uh, and I do thank the member for the question, because I've had three nurses reach out to me already today and make sure that they're in contact and we can work through this process. So I thank the minister for advocating for the nurses. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The so it's 18. That 18 sounds like a little bit bigger number than uh, in single digits, Madam Speaker. Uh, in fact, I'm actually told it's closer to 30 that have not received a check. Now, maybe they might get some today. And I also find it rather astounding that this minister thinks that 13000 or 18000 or $16,000 is a trivial amount of money, Madam Speaker. It's a lot of money to a graduate, I can tell you that. Uh, minister... Uh, I had asked you any questions on nurse grads that applied for the incentive program, and you were unaware of those numbers. Do you know actually how many did apply out of, uh, we know 18 now haven't received any money, but how many did apply? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do appreciate the question. Uh, absolutely do we want to pay these nurses, and it's, it's frustrating to hear when, when they're not getting paid in a timely fashion. I want to be very clear, both the union and health PEI, I think they're both mad at me today, um, that I was not blaming anyone. Again, back to the comments that were in the media, I did say I am not blaming either party. It's just frustrating. Again, we have to respect uh, the collective bar bargaining process and all those intricacies of that. But again, I do feel for those nurses, and I would agree with you. We need to pay them as best we can because we want them to be happy and satisfied in their jobs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, maybe I'll inform the minister that I think the number is actually about 55 that actually applied uh, that are on that list. I don't know why that was such a hard number for the minister to find out on. But uh, also during that media scrum, the minister stated that the reason for the delays in getting these bonuses to graduate was because the union uh, collective agreements with Health PEI stated that grads were caught between two collective agreements. I remember specifically him stating that in the, in the media. Does the minister know the difference between a collective agreement and a return for work service agreement. And can he explain why he feels the PEI nurses union is to blame for these grads not getting their bonus because of the collective agreement? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Speaker, and again, I'll restate, I was not blaming anybody. Again, I was just, uh, again, there was two groups. We have an employer and a union, and we want to, um, again, follow uh, all the rules of that process. It's unfortunate that some signed the return in the service agreement while the other collective agreement was in, in place, and then um, when it became time to uh, issue the payments. We worked hard on that collective agreement. I I'm very proud that we, we got it over the finish line. Um, so again, we do value our nurses. We want to work through them. Um, we're going to work through these cases as best we can in partnership with the union and the employer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness. Okay, thanks, Mr. Minister. I appreciate that you're not blaming them anymore, but you did blame them yesterday. Uh, Minister, I'm also hearing your department has allowed each nurse graduate to determine where they want to fulfill their graduate return for work service agreement with Health PEI Services. I am also hearing that these nurses went to positions that there weren't really many shortages in, while numerous hard to fill full-time vacancies remain vacant, causing extra stress on those shortages where those shortages exist. Can the minister confirm that besides full-time vacancies, that casual and part-time nursing vacancies filled by these nurse graduates are also eligible for the bonuses? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And as a former Minister of Health, uh, the members should know that we are not the employer. Uh, we do not direct hires. We do not make those hires. Again, uh, so um, that question is not properly directed at me about where we put nurses within our system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, uh, as I recall, you are the minister responsible for health PEI. <laughs> that's, your, that's, your, that's your sole responsibility is the delivery of health care services to the people of Prince Edward Island. You know, this, the, Madam Speaker, this has become a complete debacle. It reeks of the minister's previous minister's initiative bonuses to RCWs by neglecting all the other hardworking professions. No, one, now one would think this government would learn from that particular mess. Yet here we go again, another bonus, ill thought out, ill delivered, inconsistent, and everyone, as we're seeing, are disappointed in you, Minister. 
I don't use the argument saying once bitten, twice shy. Surely you can figure this out a little bit. Why would the minister and his department develop a program to incentivize nurse graduates to work at health PEI, but not develop a process where these grads would actually fill vacant and hard to recruit positions? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I think uh, we all support incentive programs for certain. Uh, um, uh, job vacancies within our, our department. It's, it's, we're in a very competitive market. Uh, we've seen other jurisdictions, again, leapfrog, uh, again, each other. So we need to try to keep our, especially our island graduates here, but also all our existing staff. So again, incentives are very important. Um, again, I think it's important to respect the collective bargaining agreement and again, and try to work through uh, with our unions, uh, uh, whoever they may be, to, to provide the best compensation. We all want the same thing. I want the same thing that the nurses union want. We want happy employees, we want satisfied employees, and we want them to have great careers from PEI. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, member from O'Leary and Burness. Madam Speaker, Minister Doolittle over here seems to think that he's, it's great to say these things, but you have to deliver on them. In a recent press release, the PEI Nurses Union stated, it is concerned about the misleading information provided by the Minister of Health and Wellness recently. Does does he agree with this statement, or can he clarify why they might put this in a press release by such a prestigious profession and a health care delivery in this province, Minister? Explain this. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Again, back to the former Minister of Health. Obviously, when, when you do a media scrum, they don't use all your comments in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the report. But I want to say I did I specifically remember saying I'm not blaming anyone. I want to be very clear on that. And I, act, and I was very clear about saying I'm not blaming anyone. I feel for those nurses who want to get paid. They're tough emails to get. And you want to, again, help these people. We made a promise uh, to them. And we need to fulfill that promise. And we need to work in, in order with our unions and with our employer to make that happen. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Question to the Minister of Health. I took a look at the patient registry this morning, over 35,000 people waiting for a family doctor, one in five Islanders. Since this government was elected, that number has soared. Since, um, it's a disaster, and when both myself and 35,000 other Islanders look at it, we see a government that is doing nothing to address access to basic health care. Question to the Minister, what is an acceptable number of Islanders without a family doctor? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Obviously, uh, the, an the real answer is zero. We, we obviously know that. That's what we're trying to achieve. Again, um, you've seen a lot of barriers come down. Very, very pleased um, of what the College of Physicians and Surgeons did on November 2nd in allowing uh, licensure for seven countries. That is a huge issue. It actually uh, helped solve our CARMS uh, residency placement issue as well. So kudos to our colleges um, that are bringing down barriers for us in order to increase that work pool. Now, we used to have a, can a pool of candidates this small. It's now this big. So I think that's a great step forward for uh, physician and health care recruitment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Royalty. Yeah, you can say that, and kudos to them for opening things up, but, but we've heard this year and year. For four years I've heard this. We're doing this, we're doing this, and the numbers keep growing, they keep tripling, they keep doubling. I'm looking at the nurses right now from 2021 to 2022. Nursing and NPs, RNs, LPNs, according to Health, uh, Health PEI, in 2021, 1862, 2022, 23, 1847. Yes. It's going in the wrong direction, Minister. Yes. Will you confirm that the numbers are going in the wrong direction for our nurses in, in our system with Health PEI, Minister. We are Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, I think we've had this issue a little bit about a kind of tracking, and we even had a meeting with the, with the union on about interpreting those numbers with, with regards to full-time, casual, permanent, and, and all the classifications that they have. So again, um, it is all those barriers are being moved down. We've increased seats in, uh, on the nursing side. We've opened up the IEN program. So again, it should have been done about five years, ten years ago. It hasn't been done, but we're doing it now. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. This was just reported on last week from Health PEI. Like, how am I supposed to interpret this? It's one line. It says, nurses, do you want the family physicians line? That doesn't get any better. It went from 126 family physicians down to 121. Mm -hmm. Please explain that line in this book because I don't understand it. Is it, is it that people are working part-time, Minister? Explain yourself. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, it is, it is it's almost like a question of what time it is. It, it, uh, 
It does change from that perspective. I know we've had a few family physicians move to hospitalist positions, so they haven't left PEI. They're still within our system, and they have that uh, choice to make about how they want to serve within our system. So again, those numbers do change. And again, um, we have some positive recruiting numbers for this year, and again, what excites me again is now we're, it's the pathway. We're not in, fishing in the same pond anymore. We have a lot more opportunities to attract people to beautiful Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister, Member from Charlottetown, so West Royalty. Really I'm starting to answer some questions now. So we have family doctors moving to hospitalists. My next question is why were there 76 people in the emergency room last night if we got all these hospitalists in the QEH working? I don't understand it, Minister. Is it, what's the impact of the doctor storage on the emergency rooms? Is it nurses? Is it family doctors moving? Is it them moving from hospitalists? What are you doing to solve this issue for Islanders? 16 hour wait times is our goal. We're up to 75 hours people are waiting in that, in that area to get into the hospital. What are we doing? What are you doing? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, again, I'm again, I'm no, I'm not a medical expert, but I don't believe our hospitalists actually work in our ER departments. So, um, from that perspective, again, we have seen massive population growth. I've said it before. You know, at 6,000 people a year or whatever it is, we do require a new physician every but every 80 days just to keep up with that influx of people. So again, that's kind of an answer to your growing population uh, or patient registry. Sorry. So again, we we are fighting against the current of population growth. There's no doubt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, you know where all of them don't work is the ICU in Summerside. How has that affected the pressures on the QEH? Minister, last year, last year there was 96,000 visits to our emergency room. The year before that, it was 78,000. Why is this number ballooning? What are you doing to get under control? And do you know the numbers at all? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I got a pretty good staff for you. We went from 155,000 people on PEI in 2019 to 175,000. So everything from grocery store visits to ER visits to uh, trips to the DMV are going up, sir. That's a pretty easy math to do. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So a quick question to the Minister of Health. How many Deputy and Assistant Deputy Ministers of Health are currently employed at the Department of Health and Health PEI, and has a number changed since 2019? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand the premise of the questions. Um, again, um, I, I will stand here uh, forever and defend um, the, our staff at Health PEI. I can assure you that every single day, my deputy is the first person in the parking garage at this facility every single day. And I can assure you that our, my two assistant deputies are also some of the last two to leave. So again, we have a strong staff both at Health PEI and the Department of Health. Uh, at, in Department of Health and Wellness, and they work their tails off. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam. I find it really difficult to believe that the minister responsible for health on Prince Edward Island does not know that number. So he doesn't know the number at Health PEI. He did not say it. He said in his department. I asked. Maybe I'll ask the question again. So I said, Department of Health. Is what he answered. Are there any at Health oh, PEI? Yes, yes. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Excuse me, I, I, I didn't really hear the full question, but again, uh, we can get into titles and in our executive leadership team at Health PEI. Again, um, there's directors, there's uh, there's uh, uh, leaders of, of physician care, so of medical society or medical uh, affairs, and so on and so forth. So I can table the org chart if that's what the uh, Honourable Member wants. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to ask you officially, will you, will you uh, table in this house a list of the deputies and the assistant deputies in health, in health, all of health, and their titles and their salary levels? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I really don't understand the line of questioning. Uh, I guess we're, we're questioning the management of our health system again. I would say again, um, these are hardworking people. You say they're uh, going to table, table. The org chart, I'm sure it's probably even in the annual report for, for anything. So again, um, we do have good staff there. They're trying to run our system. It's 6, 000, over 6,000 employees, so we need a strong executive leadership team. They do a great job, and they do work 24-7, seven days a week. Thank you, Madam Speaker.
Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Question to the Minister of Housing. We have asked for the monthly incident reports from the Every Centre. Has the Minister brought these back yet? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, no, Madam Speaker, if I'd brought them back, uh, they'd, uh, they'd have them in their hands, but uh, it's something that we're working on. I told you that um, there are some privacy concerns. It'll take some time to, to go through those. We don't want to make sure there's, we want to make sure there's no identifying information. And um, uh, I'm sure that we'll have that in due course, but it, uh, it's something that's going to take some time and effort. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Because I've sat here listening to consistent questioning con on concerns about my community. The Community Outreach Centre is in my community. The challenges are felt by myself, my family, my neighbours. I don't just drive by, I don't just drive in. I live there day in and day out. I do not represent one person or one Facebook page. I represent my whole community. And we want solutions. Closing the centre is not a solution. The individuals who use the centre will not just disappear if we close it. They need help and our community needs solutions. So today I'm here to talk about some. Question to the Minister of Housing. The number of people experiencing homelessness is growing and exponentially. When will we see an increase to transitional housing that will provide safe and consistent housing for unhoused islanders? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's a great question. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, our emergency shelters, particularly the Park Street shelter, was an, a response to a situation on the ground, and it was uh, something urgent that had to be done. I think we recognize now uh, that emergency shelter is a last resort, and that if we can prevent people from using emergency shelters, they've got a better chance of recovering and getting back into housing, stable housing in the community. We're very much focused on uh, supportive and transitional housing now. Uh, we're working hard to procure uh, more spaces, and uh, I hope to have um, some announcements about that in the future, but certainly I, I recognize the premise of your question, first of all, and I want you to know that uh, we're concentrating on that and working hard in that direction. The Honourable Leader is a third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I appreciate that and look forward to those announcements sooner, sooner rather than later. This isn't the only thing that government is failing at to support vulnerable islanders. We need more acute mental health supports. Wait time for detox are far too long. I've heard from individuals who were told when they called they'd need to wait weeks or even months. When people are ready to get help, help has to be there now. There are not enough beds and there are not enough transitional addiction services to help islanders recover after detox. Question to the Minister of Health. Will you immediately add detox beds and resources to the transitional units and staff them appropriately? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, um, I agree uh, that we do have um, uh, a crisis on our hands with your, in terms of, of drug use and mental health and PEI. Um, again, when you are in, in the health file, you, you learn some things such as uh, the, the prevalence of fentanyl um, when it hits any province, the, the, the deaths and, and harm skyrockets. Um, last year in the U.S. alone, they seized enough fent fentanyl to kill every American citizen. So if you can uh, uh, understand the potency of that, that drug. And when I visited the outreach center, I did come home to my kids and I said, you know, you just can't experiment anymore. Um, it's 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 just it's the cliff is too too uh, too close to what you do. So again, uh, we recognize there's challenges in, in in mental health and addictions on PEI. It's come to our shores. So again, uh, we're confident that we can continue to support those people that need it. Thank you. The honourable leader of the third party. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. That was not even. I appreciate that you understand that, but that wasn't my question. My community is also dealing with public drug use and dangerous drug paraphernalia, like needles being left in our public spaces. You know what could actually help? Something that's been proven time and time again to decrease public drug usage. Something our Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Morrison, has told us she supports and that our province needs, an overdose prevention site. Question to the Minister of Health. When will you identify another location for an overdose prevention site to help my community stay safe from dangerous drug paraphernalia and make sure people don't die of drug overdose? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. I can't emphasize enough how important an OPS is to support those people on Prince Edward Island. Um, again, uh, we were disappointed that, that our application was not uh, accepted. Um, this is a valuable service. It does save lives. Um, and again, back to your comments about when they're ready to get treatment. This, um, even them participating in an overdose prevention site is in, indicates to us that they're not willing to give up yet um, and that they want to stay as healthy as they can um, while they're using until they're ready to make that big step. So I would agree with the importance of an OPS site. Um, it's it's evidence-based and it's proven to save lives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Today is National Housing Day and yesterday in our response to the capital budget, I emphasized that a government that continues to pursue aggressive population growth without an associated plan for meeting expanded housing, health care and education needs is creating a recipe for disaster. We just heard the minister say we need a new GP every 80 days. With current rates of population growth, for which I will remind this House, this government has no plan to deal with whatsoever. We need to build at least 2,000 new units of housing every year. And that's just to maintain the awful situation that we currently have with vacancy rates being very low and skyrocketing rents and housing prices. A question to the Minister responsible for housing. What strategies beyond building new units, which take time and cost a lot of money, is your government putting forward to address the housing crisis on Prince Edward Island right now? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it, it's a loaded question. Uh, I could stand here and speak for an hour, probably, but uh, you know, let's let's let the capital budget speak for itself. We're, we're increasing uh, our capital spend by about 30 percent over last year's previous five-year estimate. Um, you know. I was criticized in this House in the spring that uh, quarter one for housing starts in this province were low. I can say that we've had great quarter uh, two and three and we're on track. Quarter three, in fact, is the best quarter for housing uh, development, housing starts in this province in about 40 years, matched only by quarter three in 2019. So there there are many things happening. Housing is a complex issue to uh, increase starts. There are many facets that we need to work on. Uh, certainly the labour constraints is one that's very important that we also need to focus on, but we are moving in the right direction with programs, services, investment, money. This government's responding and we're starting to see results. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the results I'm seeing are that we're falling further and further behind in meeting the needs of the growing population. This is a government that has actively contributed to the housing crisis by failing to act on a rental registry, failing to act on essential repairs and maintenance on properties that they own and run, failing to act in the critical need for emergency shelters and transitional housing, failing to act on homelessness, failing to build more public housing, simply failing for year after year after year to the same minister. Sure, there is more money associated this year than the pitiful amounts that most previous capital budgets have given us. But given this government's dismal record on actually getting things done, why should islanders have any confidence that this extra money will actually make any difference? The Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, this is something I could speak, on, uh, speak to at length. But uh, let me say that um, you know, we've built hundreds of new public housing units uh, since 2019. purchased hundreds of new units. We are currently building hundreds of new units. The number of subsidized units in this province has doubled to over, to almost three, 3,500, 3,500 subsidized units in this province. We are making investments all across the board. The number of shelter beds in this province has gone from almost none to 105. We had very few supportive and transitional housing units here. We've got about 54 now. There are almost 40 un under construction as we speak. We're moving ahead on all fronts, Madam Speaker. I could go on, but I see you checking your clock. <laughs> member from New Haven, Rocky Point, your second supplementary. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So 
we know that we need at least 2,000 units every year just to keep up. And the number that the minister cited for third quarters, which I have not seen, and that 2019, the third quarter there, was the best, is best since then. It was 571 then. So we're almost, we're, we're in that ballpark for this quarter, but for the whole year we are not. We desperately need imaginative and bold solutions, not just investments to, as the capital budget put it, I quote, start, complete, or initiate. I have no idea what initiate means if it doesn't mean start. 560 new builds over the next five years. That's 112 builds per year using my honorable member's great math skills. When we need over 2,000 to the same minister, our housing needs are immediate and they are severe. What is your government doing to leverage federal funding programs? or our housing corporation assets, or bringing forward regulatory changes, which would make a difference, again, right now. The Honourable Member, our Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I believe um, that members of this House and maybe staff are in Ottawa right now meeting with um, a Federal Housing Minister and see what we can do together. And we're looking at all kinds of innovative things. Um, and I can tell you that industry is responding in this province. It's incredible uh, the way that uh, private business will respond to needs on the ground. There are all kinds of interesting things happening in the construction industry to respond to the needs in this province uh, based on the constraints that we have. And those constraints, by the way, are, are universal across the country. And uh, I would say that um, certainly labor is one of those, and that's, uh, uh, that's the same across Canada. Um, but, you know, we are, I understand that there is a shortfall between what we need and what we can provide that's systemic, and we're working to overcome those obstacles. But we are tracking uh, housing starts about equal to last year and the previous year. Uh, and uh, I think that would come to a surprise to some in this House who raised the alarm bells uh, in the spring sitting of this legislature. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have numerous constituents that have been on the family doctor wait list for years, which means they must use maple, clinics, or emergency care for their health needs. One of those constituents has been trying to access maple for over a month now, and each time they do their request for service, the appointment gets cancelled after sometimes more than three hours due to volume. This doesn't seem to be a unique problem, as my honourable colleague here from Rustico Emerald spoke about earlier in his member statement. So my question is to the Minister of Health and Wellness. How widespread an issue is accessing Maple for Islanders? General Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. There's no doubt the utilization of Maple has almost doubled over the past year, with about 2,000 visits uh, per month. Um, we do recognize the timeout issue, especially on Mondays and Fridays. I think seems to be the worst two days um, of, of trying to access the system. I would remind everyone that it is actually uh, 8 to 8 on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and my family has had some good experience on getting through it uh, after, after supper on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and I'll probably create a big another bubble by even mentioning that. But again, it does have its surges in the system. Uh, it's not a replacement to primary care. I want to emphasize that. It's just one of the doors into our health care system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Surrey Elmira, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Health and Wellness for, uh, for that information. The backlog on Maple is from Islanders who do not have a family doctor, and those that do have a family doctor but cannot get appointments to see them. I am hearing these concerns from people right across the province. These wait times are unacceptable. So, Minister of Health and Wellness, my question is, what is the government going to do to alleviate these backlogs? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and, and thank you for the question. It's a good conversation to have about Maple. Um, it's also important to note that uh, there is a referral path through Maple to our primary access clinics um, in order for service. Um, the Honourable Member did mention prescription renewal in his, in his statement today, and it's, I think we still struggle to 
let the people know, even though Pharmacy Plus is quite well known, I still get the odd email about uh, 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 prescription renewal, so I'd encourage people to check with their pharmacist uh, before they do. Um, we understand that um, the capacity of the system is, is definitely increasing. Um, and then we need to keep uh, working on it. And again, some of our regulatory pathways will maybe uh, expand our employment pool uh, to provide that service in the, pa in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member, Mr. Elmire, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are more and more platforms like Maple being used by Islanders to access uh, some level of health care. The problem is that when people start doing it in larger numbers, the result is that it bogs down the system and just ends up becoming somewhat of a digital waiting room. If we want more Islanders to use services like Maple, we have to make sure that they are working well when Islanders need them. If we don't, then this problem will only get worse, which increases the pressure across our entire health care system, including our fire departments and emergency, emergency medical services. So a question to the Minister of Health, at what point can Islanders using Maple Expect to see some of these backlogs get cleared up. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, we have actually onboarded another five additional physicians to help with the volumes uh, of Maple. Um, again, they still maintain their uh, contractual obligations with Health PEI, so it's, uh, it's uh, extra work for them, so to speak. Um, I think it's important to recognize Atlantic Registry um, in now that those physicians can now provide virtual care in, in four other provinces and boy we'd like to see that expand across the country because I think some places like Northern Ontario or, or even the Northwest Territories with rural physicians with smaller practices may be able to help on virtual care on Prince Edward Island. Thank you Madam Speaker. The other member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you Madam Speaker. Our harness racing industry generates millions of dollars of economic activity for the province each year. There's a spend by the trainers, the owners, there's a spend by people attending the races, and there's spend from related services like ferals, veterinarian, and local feed stores. Question to the Minister of Finance. Does the province remain committed to growing the economic activity and spin-offs from the island harness racing industry? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, harness racing and PEI is recognized as a, a cultural event, an industry that we're, um, we're supporting and have supported in the past, um, and that will continue going forward. The Honourable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, race dates are split between the two tracks in Charlottetown, Summerside, with about 28 of the dates, out of, out of over 100 dates, happening in Summerside this season. Some have said that there's room to grow this market even further in Summerside. So question to the Minister of Finance, how is the province working with Red Shores and the industry to develop the harness racing market even more in Summerside? The Honourable Minister of Finance. So I think where this lands is in the hands of the um, PEI Harness Racing Industry Association. That's why that was created, so that they can look to uh, develop the industry and, and do exactly what you're saying you want to see done. So um, that's where the province would hand that responsibility for them to grow it in connection with Prince County Horsemen's Club, you know, up your way. Um, and so that's where the responsibility of that lies. Thanks. The yeah, member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think that, the, that a reasonable solution can be reached here. Adding some dates later in the season, season like November, would complement other efforts to grow the sh shoulder season, which would benefit the economy even further. Question to the Minister of Finance. What will you do to help reach a positive outcome for the industry and have more race dates in Summerside at Red Shores? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, yeah, I mean, we want to see everyone succeed in this industry, obviously. Um, um, and I think um, I was updated on this, and um, I think there were there was one race date added this year, um, and I think two race dates um, added next year. And I think the way that's handled is between the PEI Harness Racing um, Industry Association and say Prince County, um, and so they sign a contract. They make an agreement and sign a contract. Um, so again, 
those pieces are handled by the industry association. Um, you know, if 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 there's you know if there's disagreement or, or if the industry association isn't necessarily hearing Prince County, um, then you know I might have to take a look at it. But I would expect that the industry itself should be able to handle these pieces. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, final question. Thank you, Madam <clears throat> Speaker. Question for the Minister of Justice. The Minister admitted that the open drug use policy at the Charlottetown Outreach Centre was illegal. Mm -hmm. My question again was to the Chief Law Enforcement Office of this province, and the Minister said this was illegal. As the Minister of Justice, do you have a responsibility to report illegal activity, and was this a crime? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, as we wrap up the questions today, Madam Speaker, uh, the question about the outreach center and the drug use at the uh, outreach center is always an important topic and one that we, we are trying to address here. And we support our, our police, Madam Speaker, our Charlottetown police that are dealing with this. Um, at my recent FPTs, we, we discussed, this was brought up by Every minister across this country, Madam Speaker, about uh, about their situation, how they deal with uh, drug use in their communities, and it's uh, frustrating for everyone, Madam Speaker, but it's not the addicts that we're trying to get, Madam Speaker. We're trying to help our people with addictions, that most vulnerable people in our society, Madam Speaker, and we'll continue wow. to do that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Question period. Statements by ministers, beginning with the Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we've learned a lot in Prince Edward Island since we started on our path to net zero. Staff in our department have studied best practices in other areas of the world. We have made important connections with leading edge experts in climate change and in clean tech. And we want to share our knowledge with the world in return. To that end, I am pleased to announce a, par a partnership with Island Innovation. Island Innovation facilitates sustainable development and community-led change for islands worldwide. I spoke this year at their virtual summit that had 10,000 attendees, uh, including policymakers, academics, and NGOs. And I also spoke in per person at their Blue Economy and Sustainable Islands Forum in Madeira this past June. I shared stories of PEI's leadership in wind and in clean tech. I shared our challenges with extreme weather and coastal impacts of climate change. At the end of the event, I invited my colleagues from around the world back here to our province. Prince Edward Island will host the first annual Global Sustainable Island Summit in May 2020, uh, 2024 sorry, in Crowbush. The summit will bring together international researchers, policymakers, industry leaders to discuss sustainable um, energy with the help from uh, Canadian Centre for Climate Change and Adaptation and UPEI Island Studies Program. And Madam Speaker, we will put on a world-class event. And Madam Speaker, Kings County is the ideal location for such an event. This builds on our recent uh, partnership with UPEI to assess Georgetown as PEI's first net zero community. Understanding how towns use energy will help the community reduce carbon emissions and become more energy resilient. This will set uh, a course for Georgetown to become the province's first net zero community. We will roll out the lessons learned in Georgetown to other communities across this province. And of course, we are moving along with the construction of the Eastern Kings Wind Farm, generating local clean energy from Kings County. Madam Speaker, we are world leading, uh, we, there are world leading energy advances happening right here in Prince Edward Island, and I look forward to showcasing to the world our successes in 2024. Thank you. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, firstly, uh, this is a very exciting uh, announcement, and I look forward to next May, I believe it is. I'm looking forward to hopefully attending that no summit. I, thank you very much. I, I also, I, I, I'm going to take this opportunity to say how grateful I am and how encouraged I am by some of the recent statements by the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Indeed, it's a rare day in this legislature, Madam Speaker. No, I, I mean this most sincerely. Uh, I've listened to the Minister make statements on most recently the plastic um, uh, issue that, that we're dealing with here nationwide and, and the situation that PEI finds itself in. And also um, his statements regarding how we have to start thinking long term 
and how some of the challenges that we face uh, here on Prince Edward Island are uh, very indicative of global challenges that we have and how we can and actually in some ways are a leader here on PEI. And the fact that we will be hosting the first ever Global Sustainability Island Summit is, I think, a perfect fit. And I congratulate the Minister for making that happen here on Prince Edward Island. And islands are very instructive when it comes to uh, dealing with limits. Our borders are defined, we know that we're not infinite, and for me, islands, I mean, the, the small island states have often been the leaders around the world in dealing with environmental issues because of that understanding that there are limits. And for me, this summit holds the potential of dealing with the biggest policy challenge of our time, which is that we have two competing policies that are accepted almost everywhere in, in government, which is that we need to grow the economy and that we have to sustain the environment for future generations. And those two things sometimes work together, but sometimes they do not. And islands are a place where you see those limits, and there are many examples of island states that have collapsed because they overshot their limits. So again, I, I'm, I realize I'm getting close to my time here, Madam Speaker, and I don't want to get um, slapped as I did yesterday, but perfectly appropriately. Uh, but uh, I, did, I did want to take this opportunity to thank the Minister, and this is an exciting summit, and I look forward to being there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of uh, Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, it's a pleasure to rise today. and. Um, to do this statement. Um, we all need help sometimes. And whether it is one of, of what life's smaller challenges, like where to obtain a specific permit or a crisis situation, 211 is there. 211 PEI is a free and confidential referral service that makes social, community, and government programs and services across the island more accessible and easy, easier to navigate for all islanders. It connects them to vital resources 24-7, 365 days a year, and it is available to, in more than 240 languages. 211 PEI refers islanders to nearly 1,400 programs and services. Um, from more than 400 service providers, just a few examples include addictions and mental health support, parenting programs, employment and training, disability supports, and supports for seniors to help them maintain their independence. From April 2022 through March 2023, 211 PEI received more than 15,000 calls. There were more than 115,000 website visits. This service has been critical to Islanders through disaster responses, providing crucial information during both COVID-19 pandemic and in the aftermath of Hurricane Fiona. It is clear that 211 is there for Islanders in need of somewhere to turn. They can speak one-on-one -on -one with staff who take the time to truly listen help them problem solve, and point them in the right direction for resources that will meet their needs. 211 is part of the Canadian 211 network. It is provided in collaboration with United Way of Prince Edward Island, a trusted community partner who administers the service on behalf of this government. We share the commitment to making island community, communities stronger and safer. Madam Speaker, I am happy to say that government recently signed a three-year funding agreement with the United Way Prince Edward Island to ensure the valuable service will continue to thrive. Life can be hard, and find, but finding help can be easy. Anyone can access their services anytime by dialing 211 online or PE slash dot slash two slash one slash one slash dot slash CA slash CA period. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. And if anyone wants that clarified, I can do that. <laughs> Thank you. 211.ca. Yeah, that'll do it? <laughs> okay. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you for this. Yesterday, the Minister talked about 
no no island seniors that were hungry were calling her. It's because they're all calling two one one. I mean, it's like it's, that's what's happening. And this is this is an important service. This is this is way more important than anything on that page. This is a service that people can remember. Islanders can remember. Just dial 211 if you need help. You, you, this government's lucky the, the United Way is there and took this on. And I'm glad that they signed a three-year agreement and understand the importance of this because the United Way does so much in our community. On Friday night, they're, they're, they're fundraising till 11 o'clock at night at a bas basketball game. Although we're funding this program, we have to do more for the United Way. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling government right now to give them some more operational money because they do more than we know. And I want to thank them for that. And this service for Prince Edward Island is really a game changer. When people need the confidence to call somewhere, when they want to remain anonymous, they can dial 211. This is a great program in Prince Edward Island, so thank the minister for this announcement. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for, for bringing this forward today. I would take it a step further. Not only is 211 critical to Islanders, it's critical to government because they do so much to, to get out the word, to help people navigate, and all of those crucial things. I'm not sure what we would do without that 211 service. And um, I'm not sure how they keep up, honestly. You know, the amount of things that they help with, 15, over more than 15,000 calls is incredible. And I know all we need sometimes is an ear and does someone help us navigate a system. And so, you know, that I would say is the most important thing that we can do for people. And I, I can't say something that, like this without, without saying that I can imagine how you feel when you are in a position, you're 211 and you're trying to help people navigate when you get to a dead end, when there's not a service, when there's not a program there. So I'd like to, um, to thank the minister for this announcement. I'd like to thank 211 for their, for their great work. A three-year funding agreement is so crucial for organizations. I know that often our community organizations are funded through um, project-based funding, which just makes them jump through hoops and create, um, that make it create create the wheel all over again. Is that the right expression? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they just keep doing the same things and, and you know, when they, when they know what would help the community but they're forced to create a new project based on certain funding criteria. So I think this is super important and I'd love to see us do this to more community organizations. This is a great start. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Today marks National Housing Day. This year's theme is Home Is. It underscores the fundamental role that housing plays in the lives of Canadians. For generations, home ownership was a rite of passage, a guarantee, a guarantee and common milestone of adulthood. Unfortunately, due to a tight housing market, large down payments and high mortgage rates, it's no longer a guarantee for this generation. The province of Prince Edward Island wants to help islanders attain home ownership. Through programs such as the Down Payment Assistance Program and the recently announced Rent to Own Program, we are helping Islanders who wish to move out of the rental market and into home ownership. And today I'm pleased to announce a new housing support program that will further assist low to moderate income Islanders looking to buy a house. The new Closing Cost Support Program will provide Islanders up to $2,500 towards the closing costs associated with the purchase of their first home. Costs such as their insurance fees, legal fees, and taxes. And the program can be used in partnership with the province's down payment assistance program. To be eligible, applicants must be a citizen or permanent resident of Canada, be a first time home buyer, and have an annual household income of $100,000 or less. Applications for the closing cost support program will be open December 1st through the Department of Housing, Land, and Communities website. Today's announcement, along with our continued investment in affordable housing construction for Islanders on the housing registry, programs and incentives to spur private housing development like the Housing Challenge Fund and HST rebate, and reducing red tape for the building and development process are some of the ways government is showing our commitment to creating a housing market that works for everyone. Madam Speaker, I want to take the time to recognize our many partners in housing, including federal and municipal governments, developers, nonprofit organizations, landlords, and tenants. Housing is a shared responsibility, and we need to work together to improve access to housing for everyone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, thank you very much. And $2,500 for closing costs is great. If 
do you can ever remotely get in a position to buy a house? And that's what I'm hearing. People cannot even closely remote. They can't even. They, they can't even go house shopping. It used to be such a thing that we did at a certain time. They can't do that because they can't afford it. They can't even fathom that. So this announcement is good. I mean, a National Housing Day when people get in, and I hope they enjoy the money, but it just shows the further out of touchness with this government is because these programs are not there. We're losing rental housing markets. Uh, we're losing rental house. In my community, um, we've got rental, rental units moving to condominiums. It doesn't make any sense. We have a lot of work to do, and this announcement is not going to cover it up on this side and not going to cover it for me. I hope that people can take advantage of it, but we're so far out of touch. We don't have a housing plan for Prince Edward Island. We don't have a housing plan. On National Housing Day, it would be nice that the minister could stand up and say that so we knew where we were going. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank the Minister for the announcement of this program. Um, home ownership is becoming increasingly the impossible dream. And as, as was mentioned, so many are just not even, even able to afford what would have been considered a starter home not that long ago. Not that long ago at all. And, you know, people who are fortunate enough to have homes um, or have a roof over their heads. There was always, in my mind, with friends, you know, this continuum. You buy your starter home and then you start to grow your family. It's kind of be this trajectory that, that really we have taken for granted and that just doesn't really exist anymore. <coughs> At this point, you, you have a home and, and you stay there because you're lucky to have that. Um, so happy to hear another program. This is something that, that we've talked about. Um, being able to support people in these in these costs. I guess for me, the devil's in the details is looking at the eligibility criteria there um, because I know uh, from some of the other programs, people have reached out to me being having been excluded for, for different reasons. So I look forward to looking at this eligibility criteria and, um, and, and thank government for bringing this forward and let's keep them coming. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table an article from today's Eastern Graphic quoted, uh, society needs to keep moving forward, not backwards, and it points out that we need an anti-racism lens in legislation to ensure voices are respected and heard. And I move seconded by the Leader Opposition of the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Joel Carey. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a copy of the letter I sent to my federal counterpart, Minister Suds of Families, Children and Social Development, which asked to, um, which asked to form a joint working group to assess the possible benefit and impacts of a guaranteed ba basic income program in PEI. I am also including the attachment sent along with the letter of Coalition Canada, a proposal for a guaranteed basic income benefit in Prince Edward Island, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Reports by committees. The Honourable Leader of the, uh, of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As the Chair of the Standing Committee on Rules, Regulations, Private Bills and Privileges, and following the receipt of a, a report on Private Bill Number 200 of the said committee on Tuesday, November 21st, I move seconded by the Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point, that the report of the committee be adopted. So, Carrie. Carry. As a result of its deliberations, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendations to the members of the Legislative Assembly. One, your committee, having considered Private Bill Number 200, an act to amend an act to incorporate Amalgamated Dairies Limited, finds it to be private in nature and recommends that the fee for the bill be set at $80. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Okay. Uh, introduction of government bills, motions other than government, orders other than government. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the tenth order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number 10, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Bill number 106, in committee. 
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Seconded by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that this House do now resolve itself and the Committee of the Whole House take into consideration the said bill. <laughs> Shall I carry? carry. <laughs> Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitulated an act to amend the Employment Standards Act. Honourable Member, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? I would. Thank you. Shall I carry? Carried. Welcome back, Rob. Could you introduce yourself and your title for Hanser, please? It's good to be back. Uh, Robert Godfrey, Director of Policy and Research for the uh, Office of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Uh, honorable members, we're in the middle of uh, debating an amendment uh, to subsection 3.3 of the bill. And I have my uh, list clear. Honorable member. Um, thank you very much, Chair. So I have a question to the mover of this motion. Um, on the deletion uh, for the um, the piece that we had in the original, the provision um, that government or the minister may uh, support temporarily those businesses during the transition on that, why did you remove that from your amendment? Uh, Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning Population, will you entertain that question? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, we certainly want to help businesses when we make any kind of change that's going to impact them. Um, this particular item here doesn't need to be in, within this bill for because it doesn't need to be connected to law. Like we can set up programs, and we certainly want to look at programs and how we can support um, businesses when this moves forward. Promoter? Uh, Chair, but we had put it in our original um, amendment um, due to consultation, um, and again, with primarily in, in this case with the business sector um, and with the chambers that represent business right across the island. And this was something that, uh, again, was in our draft, something we presented to them, something they uh, really um, thought was helpful to especially the, the smaller businesses. Um, in particular, that might have some difficulty um, with uh, with very few employees and, and those that are open for only a, a shorter season. Um, so, how would your amendment support those businesses? The Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning, and Population. Thank you, um, Chair. Again, um, with it not needing to be in this or if it doesn't find itself into the legislation, we're, we are committing that we will find ways to help um, businesses as we move forward through this. Promoter? So you're saying today, and it's, it's in Hansard, we can only take you for your word, 
um, that you will um, support businesses through this transition in some way, shape, or form? Can I just answer? Wait. So, but your bill doesn't commit any, any support, though, no. right? So, so you're asking a question. I'm on asking about her amendment, and her amendment is deletes uh, uh, the the um, yep. clause in in the. Uh, the section in the clause, sorry, mm -hmm. in our amendment that asks for uh, financial support. Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. What I can say to answer that is we would look to support um, any community group, organization, business when we're, when we're putting bills forward. Um, and I would have to say we would be looking um, back as a department and a government as a whole, because it's not going to be one department necessarily, um, that will find ways to support businesses going forward. Promoter? Oh, thank you, Chair. I, um, Okay, I, I guess I'm only one person in here and, and one vote, let's say, but I know, uh, again, back in, in the consultation process, uh, this was something we put in specifically uh, to, to help those businesses. Um, it's difficult whenever it's, it's not in legislation uh, for me to, to feel comfortable doing it. Um, and that's not to say I don't trust you and your abilities to, to look for ways to, to, to help. Um, but I would be more comfortable if, if, if that, um, in, in your amendment, if it didn't delete that uh, particular clause. All right, are there any further questions on the amendment? Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I know we had a sort of fairly lengthy discussion, I guess, yesterday on the actual practical implications of the amendment as it is currently worded and presented. And I'm wondering whether I can ask either the promoter or the stranger to give us their interpretation of what the impact of the amendment, as it's currently written, would have on the ability of island workers to receive paid sick days. Promoter, would you like to address that? Or? Um, I'm not sure which amendment are you referring to, the one that's we're presently discussing? Uh, it's sort of a... A, an omnibus amendment, if well, I can put it that I, way. I, right now, to my understanding, <laughs> that we're discussing the amendment that was put forward by the Minister um, for Workforce uh, Advanced Learning and Population. Yes. And okay. the, I think the first three parts of that, I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately, it was, but yeah. Section 22. Point, uh, maybe the there's, chair can uh, help yes, me here. There's quite a number of pieces of it. Yeah, I think it's the top section, Chair, uh, where it's talking about after uh, a year, one day, and then after two years, uh, another day. So, uh, can you can you give me your interpretation of practically what that would mean in terms of island workers getting paid sick days? So, what my interpretation is of this uh, particular proposed subsection is that after they wouldn't get three paid or be entitled to three paid sick days until three years after employment uh, began. That's my understanding of it. Okay. It would be accumulated over those three years, one each year. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. And uh, maybe this is a question for the the minister who brought the uh, amendments forward. It's silent. The amendments are silent on what happens following three years. I understand, and there are different interpretations of exactly what the, the amendment as written would mean. And I, I have a slightly different interpretation from the from the mover of the bill, um, but. Can I ask the mover of the amendment, what would happen on year four? Are, can you ever accumulate more than three days? If you use three days sick leave, let's assume the generous interpretation of, of the, the mover of the bill, that you have three paid sick days after three years. If you use them in year four, can you ever accumulate another sick day? Because it's, the, the amendment is unclear to me on that. Minister, would you like to address that? Minister yes. of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, thank you for the question. And we did have a fulsome conversation yesterday for sure that probably everyone kind of got a little uh, confused with. So what we've put in is uh, that the um, employee would be, it's an entitlement. So after one year of employment, you would get one after 12 months. Mm -hmm. After two years, you'd be entitled to two. And after 36 months, you'd be entitled to three. 
Um, should you use, so year four you're working and you, you get ill and you use your, your three days, the next year you get the three days. Like you're entitled to that. That's what the worker, you're entitled to those benefits that you get as an employee. If we use the other wording that we had talked about yesterday, carryover, it implies an addition. So three plus three plus three, if you don't use them, becomes, like that's what carryover would have meant to me as an employee in my past careers, I was like, oh, I get to keep adding. Um, but for an, an entitlement is that they will always have three sick paid sick days per year after the 36 months of continuous work with that individual employer. New Haven, Rocky Point. Chair, and I, I appreciate them. that's how the minister interprets these amendments. Um, I, I'm not so sure. Uh, there is nothing, there's no provision in these amendments, nor if you add up the bill, as amended, assuming this amendment would pass, it's silent on what happens after three years. And yes, it says after three years, you can accumulate three up to three sick days. But if you use them in year four, there's nothing to suggest in there that in, year, in, in the next year, you will start to accumulate again. And that, for me, is a big problem. Can you, can you absolutely assure the House um, or, or we, I think perhaps we need a legal opinion on this because, again, it's silent on what happens in year four. Yeah, so I'll I uh, ask the Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning Population Thank to you. Uh, talk about your legal help. Yes, yeah, so we, this amendments. has been reviewed legally <laughs> extensively. Um, we'll start there um, and, and helping us work through this for sure. Um, you know, an employee, when we say the employee is entitled and, and they have it, it's not like accumulated. So when they come to, for example, if they start an employment on January 1, three years from that January 1, they have those, those three days. If they, they don't have to accumulate them. You're, you're given three days because that's what you're entitled to after 36 months of work. So if you use them during that time frame, you've had your three paid sick days. The next year, you have three paid sick days again because that's what you've worked yourself to be entitled to. New Haven Rocky Chair, Board. at the risk of going round in circles here. Um, no uh, risk, we are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, there is, there is nothing at all in the way that these amendments are written which actually confirms what the Minister has just described. I appreciate that's how you interpret it, Minister. But um, uh, the scenario I, I have used and the Minister reiterated around using all of your sick days in year four, there is nothing in this bill that, that provides me with comfort and confidence that in future years uh, further days will be accumulated. I'm quite sure that that's the intention of what the Minister wants to happen and I'm not doubting that. But um, I would love to, I, I'd love a different explanation other than what, what if we use all the days in year four, uh, there is, can you show me in this amendment what, what clause tells me that in the next year of my employment, not year one of my employment, this is not year one of my employment, but in the, in the subsequent year of my employment, I will, I, I will get another sick day. Minister, can you show me the clause? This again? Pardon? Would you like to address the question again? It's, yeah, it's, it's, Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. So in, cl in clause four, it, it does indicate, dictates entitlement. So that's what we're, entitlement means that they'll have that. So um, like after one year, you're entitled to the one day paid sick, entitled to and such. I guess, yeah. I think that's all I, I don't know what else to add to make that better. Shall the amendment carry? Carry. 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 Uh, I heard both sides. Uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. All those uh, in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All those against the amendment, please raise your hand. The amendment has, uh, has carried. All right, members, we're on section four. Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. 
I have an amendment that I would like to propose removed for section four of bill 106. Um, is amended by the de uh, deletion of the words on the earlier of a date that may be fixed by proclamation of the lieutenant governor and council or 180 days after the date of royal assent and the substitution of the words on a date that may be fixed by proclamation of the lieutenant governor and council. And they have, there is copies to be read. All right. Members, copies of this amendment will be distributed. Chair, do you mind if I ask a question on this amendment? Yeah. Members, uh, while it's being distributed, the promoter of the bill is just going to uh, be ask uh, the minister for clarification. Thank you very much. And that's exactly what is the reason for um, this uh, amendment to that particular section? Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. So we really we wanted to have a chance also to, you know, build um, good messaging, good supports, and appropriate regulations for this. So uh, in order to do that, that, those things do take time. Um, we want to do what's good for Islanders and, and as soon as, as we can, knowing that it does sometimes take some time to get businesses to appropriate regulations. We want to have that in place so we can sure we do that well. Sure. Promoter? So when you say supports, does that mean supports the financial support to <laughs> businesses that may, on a temporary basis, uh, have some difficulty? Supports would refer Minister to Workforce all of the elements population. in this bill around communication and such that would go with that. Lead a third party. Section three, right? We just passed the amendment. That's uh, Leader Pru. That's correct. Uh, I need to go back and and uh, pass the full section after it was amended. I have an amendment for section three. So no. would you rather me wait to present it until this before, like right before you go to pass? Yeah, honourable members, we'll deal with this amendment, and then we'll go back when we go back to carry the full section three. Then you could make an amendment at that time. Okay. My apologies. So we'll carry on with the amendment. Uh, we'll carry on with section four and, until the time that we'll go back to section three. Are there any other questions on this amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Carry. Yeah. Chair, I'm sorry. I, I did have my hand up, but New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you very much. So the. The change that's being made here is that the proclamation will be 180 days after the Royal of Assent, substituted by on a date that may be fixed by proclamation of the Lieutenant Governor and Council. Essentially, that means, and we, and we know because this has happened with previous bills in this House, that that's an open-ended statement, which means that it can be proclaimed whenever or perhaps never into the future. And uh, I think it's important that before we vote on this uh, amendment, that uh, I'd, I'd like to know the reason why this change is being made. So this promoter asked that same question. Oh, my apologies. My apologies, Chair. Okay. Are there any other questions on this amendment? Shall the amendment carry? Carry. Yeah. Show of hands on the amendment. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. All those against the amendment. Okay, the amendment is carried. Okay. Shall section four as amended carry? Carried. Thank you, members. So, members, we're going to go back to section three. I never carried the full section. So, section three as amended. Carrie? No. Okay, we have an, uh, an amendment putting, being put forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I guess p before I present the amendment, since we're still on Section 3, I recognize the government amendment passed, but I guess I would just like to take one minute to recognize the fact that we all in here are privileged to have sick days. If we are not feeling well, we don't have to answer to anybody. We do what we need to do to make ourselves better. 
to not infect our coworkers. Um, when I think back to my time in the education system, how privileged I was to have that sick time that could accumulate. I had to go off early because I had uh, a really challenging first pregnancy. And thank goodness I had those sick days. I don't know what I would have done without them. And so I would like for all of us in here to consider that this five paid sick days is not too much to ask, yet government for some reason wants to botch this and not give Islanders paid sick days, and I find it very insulting. Anyway, I will present my amendment. Um, so, do you want me to read the amendment? Thank you. Yes, please. Do I start reading here? Yeah, okay. Moved that Bill 106 is amended by subsection 33 of Bill 106, is amended by the deletion of the proposed subsection 22.25 and the substitution of the following. Rate of pay, five. An employer must pay an employee who takes leave under subsection four an amount in money equal to at least the amount calculated by multiplying the period of the leave and the average day's pay, where the average day's pay is determined by the formula amount paid divided by days worked, where amount paid is the amount paid or payable to the employee for work that is done during and pay that is earned within the 30-day calendar period preceding the leave, excluding pay in lieu of vacation, gratuities, or benefits, less any amounts paid or payable for overtime. And days worked is the number of days the employee worked or earned pay, excluding pay in lieu of vacation, gratuities, or benefits within that 30-day period. And I believe the clerk has copies of that amendment. Okay, thank you, members. Um, Honourable Member, we're actually going to take a quick recess to see if your amendment is actually in order, and then we'll come back with a, a ruling.
this one. All right, honorable members, uh, we're back. Uh, we just wanted to confirm um, that it wasn't impacting something that had already previously mm -hmm. been deleted by the past amendment. So uh, the leader of the third party's amendment is in order and uh, copies are being distributed. All right, any honorable members, is there any discussion on the amendment? All right, members, are there any questions on this amendment? Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. So the way that work has uh, evolved over, well, recently anyway, is that people no longer enter uh, a job out of high school or college or university or whatever um, and stay in that for their entire life. Uh, that's very unusual these days. It used to be absolutely the given. But that's not the case anymore. And this amendment is designed to be able to capture all of the various ways in which Canadians, islanders in our case, now work so that they would still qualify for paid sick days because it's up. I believe that every single island worker deserves to have paid sick days. And the way the original bill was drafted does not include people who um, work in, for example, the gig economy, where you may have two or three jobs. That's a very, very common way to make your living these days. Two of my own children do that. Um, and given that you can't say after full-time employment in a particular job for a year, you, you have earned yourself one paid sick day, many, many people will never ever get to that position because they don't have a single job. However, they're working 40, 50, 60 hours a week in order to, to uh, make ends meet. Another example is people who are paid piecework. I'm thinking here, for example, folks who pick berries. Um, and they are not paid a rate of pay per hour. They are not paid uh, a salary. They are paid for a, a particular job to get done. That's work. It's hard work. Um, and yet those people would be excluded from the legislation as it currently exists. So this motion, this amendment, excuse me, Chair, is designed for, to make sure that the legislation captures all potential forms of employment on Prince Edward Island and therefore grants paid sick days for every single island worker, which is, to my mind, a really important thing. Thank, Thank you, you Honourable uh, Member. Uh, members, we're going to now report uh, progress and uh, switch over to uh, third party time. So, Chair, I move that the Speaker take the Chair and the Chair remore, uh, report progress and consider um, and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Call Kerry. Kerry, Honourable Leader of the Third Party, 
Oh, Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Madam Speaker, I move, uh, seconded by the Leader of the Third Party, that the 11th order for the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number 11, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number 2, Bill number 107, in committee. Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that this House resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall I carry? <laughs> Honourable Member from West Scramorill, Chair Committee of the Whole, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the bill to be entitled an act to amend the Employment Statutes Act number two. Um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm deaf too. Uh, would you like to bring a stranger on the floor? Yes, I do. I don't see her. But. There's, there's a stranger in the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall it be granted? Granted, yes. Let's go ahead. <laughs> Can you state uh, your, your name for the record? Michelle Patterson, uh, Director of Policy and Research for the Third Party. Thank you. Um, so uh, we're just doing general questions uh, on the Act, and so I think uh, if it's uh, the will of the committee, we'll just continue along those lines. Uh, anybody have any general questions? Leader of the Opposition. Uh, so the promoter of the bill, so this is a, a same, basically the same bill, uh, asking for the same things, uh, there are some differences in it. Um, prior to uh, leading up to this, um, we did have a conversation initiated by you about saying, doesn't matter which bill, we'd like to see one of them get across the, the line. So I just need some clarity on if that was the case, then why would you today um, bring four amendments to our bill? You, you, have, you brought one forward. Uh, it's currently under debate, um, and then you said you had three more if you had your own bill coming on afterwards. How can you justify why you would do that? Yeah, absolutely, okay. and I appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. I was going to send mm -hmm. you a text actually mm -hmm. before I came up, and then I ran out of time. Mm -hmm. um, I was so sitting right here. In our, in our, um, yeah. motor. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. In our discussion, um, I had initiated that discussion to let you know, just like you said, I want one of these bills to pass and let you know that we had some amendments to come forward. Because despite which bill passed, we wanted to make sure that it was <coughs> the best that it possibly could be, depending which bill came first. And unfortunate timing today, we ran out of time, and that still stands. Whichever one passes, we want paid sick days. Whichever one passes first, it doesn't matter whose passes, as long as it's the best that it can possibly be. Leader of the Opposition. Um, is there anything in your bill regarding any kind of uh, financial support uh, for businesses for the transition period? Yeah, we didn't make it too prescriptive, only because we, you know, we know it's government that has the purse strings and that mm -hmm. will, that kind of has all the information they need to know which businesses they want to support. But the financial support program is in section 310, so, no, yeah, right, yeah, 310, um, do you want me to read it? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Uh, subject to subsection 12, the minister may implement a financial support program to provide temporary financial support to be given to employers to help them adapt 
to any increased costs associated with, associated with paid sick leave provided under subsection 4. Okay, so Leader of the similar. opposition. Uh, so that's similar to what the provision that we have in ours, in the sense that there are, ours was that the government uh, or the minister may uh, provide some temporary uh, financial support in the transition period of it. Um, did you have any conversations with the Minister of uh, Workforce and Events Learning on that particular clause? No. And yeah, leader of the opposition. Mr. So how did you come up with, um, with with that clause? Who did you who did you consult with? Who, what legal counsel gave you the advice that that clause would actually work? So yeah. where I'm gonna I'll start here and let mm -hmm. you take over if there's anything. Um, where we landed with that was based on the uh, support program that was available for workers during the COVID period, which was called oh, that the fund that was there to help people if they were sick. Do you, uh, what was it? Uh, inter intervention, Minister of Finance. I just can't remember the name of the, the fund. COVID support. COVID support program, COVID support yeah. Program. Um, and so there were funds in there that, that we had kind of said all along, why not use that fund for sick days? And so that's where that idea initially came from. Um, and then I don't know if there's anything. Yeah, I, I think that explains it. These are just provisions they don't mandate the minister because we're not able to do that, um, bringing a bill forward. But they do, um, I think they were well received by the um, employer groups as well to kind of point to the minister providing support. The other, the opposition? Chair, so it is, there is some similarities to the one we had, the provision we had um, in our amendment and um, obviously that was deleted with an amendment uh, put forward. Um, and when I questioned that, because I thought that was, it's really important, uh, especially to the mom and sh shops, right, who have, a low number of employees. I'm not looking at the Walmarts or, or Cavendish Farms or anything like that. I'm looking at more the, the impact it would have in the mom and pa shops who are open, even whether it's year round or even for six months of the year um, or, or eight months of the year, what, what, what have you. Um, and so, with that response, um, the minister, I guess my um, <laughs> I, guess I, I had my own my own thoughts on it, but the minister basically uh, committed that they would do everything they possibly could to support those businesses. And, and I said I'd have to take her word on it, obviously, uh, because there, if if it was taken out, there's nothing in there with that provision um, saying that they would do it or may do it. Um, but I'm wondering now because my what was presented to me was that it pro it wouldn't hold. That provision would not hold, and I don't know how yours would hold any more than the clause that we had in, which was very similar. Like water. I yeah. I guess we shall see. <laughs> Leader of the official opposition. True. <laughs> I mean, there may be an amendment coming. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I think we can rest um, assured. But on that, but okay, that's that's it just for now. Okay. Yep. Is anyone else uh, speaking? General questions. Uh, is it the Pleasure of the committee, the bill we read clause by clause. No. Uh, would we like to uh, call for the question? No All right. Shall the bill carry? No. no. Okay. Uh, I think we'll have to get some more clarification. All those in favor say yay. Yay. And I'm just carrying the bill. Okay. So one person wants to carry. All those against say nay. Nay. Uh, the nays do have it. In my opinion. Surprise. So. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill not recommended. Okay. Shall it carry? Oh, yes, right. Uh, 
Uh, Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be entitled an act to amend the Employment Standards Act No. 2, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and does not recommend the same to the Legislative Assembly. And I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Carry, Chair. A recorded division has been requested. Uh, Sergeant Arms, you can ring the bell. Members, all those report, uh, voting against the report of the committee, please stand. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honorable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, and the Honorable Member from O'Leary Inverness. Members, all those Voting in favor of the report of the committee, please stand. <clears throat> the Honorable Minister of Education and Early Years, the Honorable Minister of Finance, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Honorable Member of, sorry, the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honorable Member from uh, Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors, the Honorable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Honorable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, the Honorable Member from Summerside, Wilmot, the Honorable Member from Rustico, Emerald, the Honorable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Honorable Members, the report of the committee has passed. <clears throat> Honorable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Sorry, Madam Speaker. Uh, I move seconded by the Leader of the Third Party that the 12th order of the day be now read. Well, Carrie. Carrie. Order number 12, an act to amend the Residential Tenancy Act, Bill number 108, ordered for second reading. Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that this House now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House no, to take into member. consideration the said bill. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I move that the bill be now read for a second time. That's not Bill right. Carey. Bill number 108, an act to amend the Residential Tenancy Act, read a second time. Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker, for your indulgence. I move that this House now resolve itself into a committee of the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? Honourable Member for Rustic River Road, please chair committee of the whole.
This is now in the committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intentional an act to amend the Residential Tenancy Act, Bill Number 108. Uh, is it the pleasure of? Oh, would you like to bring a, a stranger on the floor? Please. Uh, is it granted? It's granted. All right. Hello, stranger. <laughs> Could you please uh, state your name and position for the record? Michelle Patterson, Director of Policy and Research for the Third Party. Thank you. Uh, is it the pleasure of the committee that the the bill now be read clause by clause? General questions. It is then. Seeing no objection. Uh, any questions? Oh, uh, actually, promoter, would you, would you like to make an opening statement? Sure. Um, so this amendment proposes to extend the uh, rent eviction moratorium, which was put into place in 2021. Uh, given that we were we had such low vacancy rates and. Um, when people were being evicted for renovation purposes, there wasn't anywhere else for them to live. Given the vacancy rate has actually gotten worse, um, we thought it was important, despite the fact there are there are um, protections now with the RTA, we thought it was important to continue this protection for tenants until the vacancy rate improves, which would get for one year, for one year. Thank you, promoter. Um, I have no one on my list right now. Oh, Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Um. <clears throat> so I understand there was a lot of debate about um, the original implementation of this moratorium and obviously I wasn't here at the time but uh, I wonder if we could just uh, go over some of the rationale for the, uh, the implementation of the moratorium at the time. Yeah, sure. I, I can, or you is it, is it, okay. um, So at the time, uh, and I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question directly, let me know if I'm, you can stop me mid-sentence if I'm not. Um, so at the time, we were seeing people getting evicted um, without any sort of protection in place before the Residential Tenancy Act was put in. And so at the time, while we were waiting for the Residential Tenancy Act to pass, before it was the Rental of Residential Properties Act, and there weren't the protection for tenants in, the, in that piece of legislation to say, so now in the new Residential Tenancy Act, we do have first right of refusal after such an event, um, and there, there are some other hoops for, for landlords to jump through when they are planning a renovation. Um, and so there are things in place to protect tenants, and tr including rental caps and, and that sort of thing. So we were pleased with that when the Residential Tenancy Act was put into place. We find ourselves now in a position where the vacancy rate has gotten worse. And at this point in time, given that we don't have housing for people to go to, those protections in the RTA are, are, are rather a moot point if you don't have a place to go. Um, and so we thought that until such a time, well, we give it a year to see where we end up in November 2024 um, to see if, if, if things have changed, but it's basically just to ensure that we don't see our numbers of homeless increase based on people being renovic, renov, renov, or evicted for renovations. Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, yeah, so I'm wondering at the time, was there a was there a sense that um, people were being being evicted, uh, or that the evictions for renovation purposes was being used as an excuse or being abused as a way to um, as for landlords in bad faith to get rid of tenants? Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, you know, there's there's not. It's not always in bad faith that these things happen, but there are cases where it was in bad faith that these things happened. And so people would find themselves evicted and then see their apartments being advertised for, you know, for higher rents, which, which would be more controlled now under the Residential, Residential Tenancy Act, of course. Right. Um, but again, given there's no housing stock or, or other units for people to move into, um, yeah, we kind of, not that we're in the same position, we're certainly not, but that vacancy rate is really, really hindering us from, from seeing the benefits of the new Residential Tenancy Act. 
Uh, Minister okay. of Housing, Land and Communities. And so in um, arriving at your position that we need to extend the, the moratorium, have we considered all of the pr provisions that exist in the new act and how, as, as a whole, um, uh, how they protect tenants? A promoter, you go go right ahead. Just promoter, go right ahead. Yeah, you can go okay. right ahead. Thanks, yeah. Chair. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was a discussion that we had in our office um, about, and that was actually when we first started talking about this amendment, that was one of the things that we kind of thought of first. And, you know, when you're kind of having early discussions on something and you're brainstorming, that was one of the things that someone in our office had brought up, you know, with the new Residential Tenancy Act. I mean, it's not it's not perfect, right? Nothing's perfect. It's not going to protect tenants from, from uh, rent increases they can't afford, but it's going to put that cap. And people can kind of find comfort in the fact that they're not going to have to pay rents that go above a certain amount. They kind of know what to expect. Landlords know what to expect getting into um, the business. And so uh, I kind of lost my train of thought. Just considering all the provisions as right. a whole that are meant to protect uh, uh, tenants against um, um, bad faith rent evictions. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, we we would love to see the opportunity to see the Residential Tenancy Act in action, to see how these protections do, how far they do go. Um, but unfortunately, again, it's that vacancy rate that's hindering us from kind of seeing that because people just don't have anywhere to go. Uh, Minister, another question? Yeah. Um, um, housing, land, and communities? Okay, so what I'm hearing is you don't necessarily have any reason to believe that the provisions are inadequate for, for protections um, and that it would possibly be prudent just to uh, evaluate how the provisions are working, but you're concerned that if they're not working and people are being put out, they have nowhere to go. That's the concern, right? Am I correct? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I heard you say that um, it would be nice to allow the act some time to um, um, to work its way through the system uh, to, to test the act um, to see if it's actually providing adequate protection. But you feel that this is what I heard, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. But you feel that it's better if we just extend the um, the deadline, the moratorium. Um, because you don't want to find out <laughs> if it's actually working. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Chair, I keep forgetting. No, no. Um, so the Residential Tenancy Act, as it is, you know, perfect, no, but much better. And we do believe that tenants have that, that protection. However, the problem is it doesn't matter if you get first right of refusal back to your apartment if you don't have a place to go while your apartment is getting worked on. Yes. Yeah. You know, and so it's not, it's, this isn't about the merits of the RTA, it's, and the protections, I, I guess the protections, it doesn't matter what act we would really be under at this point, I shouldn't say that, because there are certain protections, however, um, there's nowhere for people to go in that meantime, and so regardless of the protections that are there, if people don't have a place to live, they almost don't matter. Uh, so, Mr. I do have others on the list. Okay. Well, sure. Uh, Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. I guess I'm just wondering, uh, thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering what specifically is missing in the current act that we have right now that would warrant this extension. So th there's nothing missing from the act. It's just the low vacancy rate. Okay. That, like, in, in the new Residential Tenancy Act, and, and if you know this, I'm sorry, the, the new Residential Tenancy Act gives a couple of protections for tenants, and one of them being if you get evicted for renovation purposes, you get a first right of refusal. When, you, when, when the project is complete, you can go back and say yay or nay to that, and okay. there's no astronomical no rent right. increase that has happened because that protection is there, which is phenomenal. I, but just the point being that the vacancy rate is so low that people are having, if they're, if they're lucky enough to find another place even, like, they just have nowhere to go. And so when people are run evicted, they're, they're basically homeless. So it's not about questioning the merits of the RTA. It's just about people have nowhere to go when they're asked to leave their apartments. And of course, there are still things in place. You know, if a building is falling apart, well, you have to fix it, you know, but it's just those kind of 
projects that might be able to wait a little bit longer until we see a healthier vacancy rate. That's the, the point of it. Minister of Economic Development and Innovation. Just one more. Uh, do you have any evidence, any way to, to prove or anything there that would make you believe that the bill is not capable of managing this process? Anything that evidence base that you would have that would I feel like I answered that. Yeah, I, I think just to reiterate, it's just that low vacancy rate. We know just how much vacancy. trouble individuals are having getting a home. It's not necessarily the bill. The bill um, has a lot of good provisions that will work well once we reach that healthy vacancy rate. Um, there's just this provision is just really important. Um, to tenants while that vacancy rate is so, so low right now. Thank you. Um, any uh, further questions? Oh, Minister, or member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. So if I get it correct, the original uh, moratorium that was brought forward was brought forward while the act was being developed. The act is there now, it's working, but you want to extend it a year because we got a low vacancy rate? Yeah. So it's working. The act's there, it's working now. Got a, a lot of great things that we've heard about. But we want to extend the moratorium that was put in place while the act was being developed another year just because the vacancy rate is low. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, Yes, but actually the act was passed with this clause included. So after the, before the act was passed, we put um, this moratorium in place. And after the act was passed, we kept the moratorium in place a year ago because the vacancy rate was low. That was the justification for it. So this year, and we put it in for a year so that we could reassess in one year. Um, and we're back and the vacancy rate is actually lower. So we propose extending it another year and then letting the Residential Tenancy Act work as it does once we have a vacancy rate that's healthy, which I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is three, four or five percent. And right now we're looking at one percent. So. If that points out. Yeah. Thank Less you for that. that. Thank you for that, Michelle. All right, member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you for bringing this forward. I have met with the fight for affordable housing. This is their number one thing. They told me that this is a problem. Um, this is their number one thing that they're seeing on the ground. They're not talking about an act not working, like we're talking about here. They're talking about people being put out. And that's the message that I got loud and clear. Have you talked to them? <laughs> At some point, we have to listen to, to the people um, that are on, so on the streets. Like, so radical. Um, Anyway, have you talked to that group, and what were they? What was the message to to the mover of this bill or amendment? We did talk to this group, and the same message. This was the top priority, um, and they were very, very concerned about about this, given the low vacancy rate. You know, they did. They didn't mention from from conversations I had. There was really no mention of the whether it be the resident rental of residential property act or the new RTA, there was no mention of that. It was simply there's the vacancy rate is so low tenants are, they're terrified because one of the big problems is we hear from tenants who, who have issues in their apartment, but they're too scared to say anything because they're scared they'll get evicted for renovation purposes. And so we have people living in fear that if they ask to have some fairly routine maintenance, or if there is a big problem, they're scared to bring it forward because they're scared they're going to be asked to leave their apartment and where will they go. And so it is a huge struggle for, for tenants right now, whether they be actually impacted or not, just that fear. You know, I've, there's so many things, there's been so much changes in the, in the rental, pro, rental world in the last few years that tenants are really scared right now. And, and you know, the Residential Tenancy Act was something that they had a lot of faith in. Of course, people are divided in, in what they feel about that. Some are, think it's great or where others have some issues and, and everyone in between. But right now, it's just that vacancy rate that has people scared. Yeah. I'm from Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, and, and that's what I heard, that it was 
it was j just because we passed legislation and we heard here with the with the taxation officer that we don't have the enforcement across the province to enforce a lot of a lot of what's happening in here has um, the, the minister just said we're not giving this bill enough time to see if it's working I say that we don't what I'm hearing is that people who've been run evicted or, or out in the street, they will not come forward with what they're talking about. Um, do you get the same impression? Is that that's how it is with people who have been run evicted or le left on the, to fend for themselves in PEI? Could you repeat that? Please? Yeah, so what are the people saying? Have you talked to anybody that this has happened to, um, have been, you know, put out for various reasons or, or whatever? Is there any examples of that happening? Absolutely, and and when they're talking about it, they're not necessarily talking about, um, you know, the protections that the RTA offer. They're just simply saying, "Where am I going to go?" Because you know, this doesn't stop all renovations, of course, right? But it does. It does kind of stop the the ones that that it can. <laughs> That's not a good exp a good explanation. But it's not going to stop all renovations. But it is a step towards helping people um, in that case but yeah like I said they're not they're not arguing the merits of the art they're not mentioning the RTA at all they're just saying they're just pleading with where do we go where do we go what do we do um, so that's we don't hear anything about legislation it's desperation so and what, talking to the group and others when you're using um, you, you should never and, and, and landlords don't they don't do they this is the last step, is to come in where people have to leave the unit to renovate. A lot of things can be done and the person does not have to leave. So it shouldn't be used. And I think what was happening before, it was being used as an excuse to make changes or whatnot in a, in a unit. Um, would, you, would you agree with that statement that, that, that before, if a landlord is to use this, that they can do a lot of the renovations without removing the tenant? Yeah. And, I, and I've heard of, of, there's been a lot of examples of people having to leave when the renovations weren't necessarily worth having to move out for. Um, so this just an added layer of protection. I'm from Charlottetown, West Royalty. When I talked to the group, the, the um, you know, um, there's a lot of people in my, my area, Browns Court and different, different places that are marginalized and they, they, they're living here and they're living in substandard conditions. Um, so um, they're scared, and that's what I'm hearing about. Is they're 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 petrified. Are you hearing the same thing that rent evictions affect disproportionately marginalized people? Absolutely. That's who you know. That's where we see PI Fight for Affordable Housing often standing up for more marginalized groups because they're the ones that tend to be. Um, you know, speaking uh, statistically, more precariously employed, um, especially if you're a newcomer to the province. And, and if there's a language barrier, too, if there's even more of a, of a barrier there to, um, to be able to kind of advocate for yourself or to even try to make other provisions for yourself to find a new place to live, that language barrier. So absolutely, I would agree with that statement. I'm from Charlotte Town West Royalty. Yeah, and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought this forward because... I was looking at it too, and not because we don't know if the RTA is not working or working. The minister mentioned bad faith, good faith. It doesn't. It doesn't really matter. It matters that we're hearing that this is still a problem in Prince Edward Island. This is not putting anything out. It's just adding protections to people who are scared because we screwed up the rental numbers in our province, and there's no place to live. So I am going to support this uh, member because. I am just as worried and I see people living in conditions and they do not need this to worry about too. So I will support your, your great amendment here to put this in place until we can see that, that the RTA works because right now this amendment and I support it because it, it is about people and it is about people without a voice. Thank you very much. Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Yeah, well. You know, I, I've heard it stated here that there is a problem, and it's been three weeks since um, the ban has been lifted. You would think if there was a pent-up demand uh, for large renovations that require people to be evicted from their 
apartments over the past two years that people would come forward, and they have not. I've spoken with the Director of Residential Tenancies. There is no demand for this at the moment. And I would contend that with the provisions that are in here, the pendulum has swung so far to the protection of the tenants that it makes no sense for any landlord to propose a, a, a renovation so significant that the tenant would need to be invict, evicted. But it bears um, pointing out that the director has discretion to make that determination of whether or not the unit actually needs to be vacated to do the renovations. Now, it only makes sense given that the um, that the landlords can only increase their rent by a maximum of 6% a year if they were to get three allowable and three um, greater than allowable. It only makes sense to wait until the, until the unit is vacant. Um, I think that the provisions are so rigorous in here that there will be, it cannot be abused. And I, I, I've heard this described as still being a problem, but I don't see it. So uh, can you elaborate on how, you know, people's fears of being renovated is one thing, but it's legally very difficult to happen now. And that was the purpose of that interim period of the moratorium is to bring in these provisions. I think they're strong enough, um, but I'm still waiting to hear something that would convince me otherwise. Well, I guess I, I've kind of said all that there is to say on this. I guess one thing I would say is often people, people don't all, always reach out when this happens, right? So you were I, saying... Um, but who, who would reach out to who? Well, you were just saying, who did you say no one reached out to? The director or to your department? IRAC. To no IRAC. one has okay. asked yeah. to renovate anybody. Yeah. And so I guess to that, I say, you know, this would be, this is a preventative measure. And we've heard from all of the advocacy groups that this really was important. Um, and so in, in the spirit of that, I guess, you know, I, anything to protect people in their homes right now. Because, you know, and, and just on my drive to work this morning, the amount of homelessness I see on a daily basis is growing. And... I'm not saying it's all because of this. It's certainly, there's lots of reasons for it, but any single measure that we can take in here to protect people's homes, I'm willing to do. Um, and this is one that people who work with, with tenants every single day, this is what they tell us matters right now. And I, I have to believe them. All right, shall, shall the bill carry? Carry. Um, all for, say yay. Yay. All against, say nay. 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 I'm going to ask for a show of hands. All four, say yay, raise your hand. I'll make it easier for you, Chair. I'll call for a standing vote. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait. Yeah. You can do that, member, but definitely. I'll let, let the speaker look after that one. Um, all those against, raise your hand. Okay. Uh, yeah. So the bill um, has been, is not recommended. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take to the chair and that the chair report the bill not recommended. Shall I carry? Madam Speaker, as Chair of Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Residential Tenancy Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and does not recommend the same to the Legislative Assembly. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall carry. Recorded division has been requested. 
Sergeant, De Deputy Sergeant Argent may ring the bell. Oh, members, all of those voting against the report of the committee, please stand. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Honorable Member from New Haven Rocky Point, the Honorable Member from O'Leary and Verness. All those voting in favor of the report, please stand. The Honorable Minister of Finance, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice and Public Safety, the Honorable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Honorable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honorable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Honorable Member of Fisher Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Honorable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, the Honorable Men Minister of Social Development and Seniors, the Honorable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Honorable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. The Honorable Member from Summerside Wilmot. The Honorable Member from Rustico Emerald. The Honorable Member from Surrey Elmira. The Honorable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Honorable Members, the report of the committee has passed. Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I now call, seconded by the leader of the third party, motion 77 be now read. Shall I carry? Motion number 77. The member from New Haven, Rocky Point, moves, seconded by the leader of the third party, the following motion. Whereas the Confederation Trail is widely considered to be a provincial treasure unique in Canada that it, in that it spans almost the entire province from tip to tip. And whereas the Confederation Trail is the central active transportation spine of our province, to which many other active transportation trails connect. And whereas there are multiple benefits, including environmental, health and wellness, and economic, to developing a comprehensive, interconnected, active transportation network across our entire province. And whereas the area of experiential tourism is growing rapidly. And whereas Prince Edward Island is already being recognized around the world, as an ideal place to enjoy such experiential vacations with people being attracted by the peace and tranquility found on the Confederation Trail as it is currently utilized. And whereas Tourism PEI specifically recognizes the attributes of developing tourism related to active transportation, saying in their most recent strategy, develop and execute a holistic walking and biking trail strategy with the outcome of an increased number of visitors whose main activity is experiencing walking and or biking trails with the additional revenue from longer haul travelers with significant 30 plus night stays. Therefore be it resolved that this legislature express its support to maintain the Confederation Trail in its current form as it was originally intended and therefore be it further resolved that this legislature urge government not to grant access to any part of the Confederation Trail for all terrain vehicles other than at already designated crossing points. I'll remember from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise this afternoon and to speak to this motion. We've uh, covered quite a lot of topics in this legislature and uh, I'm quite sure that I'm not the only one who sits in this house. Uh, who's been contacted on a regular basis uh, by folks who 
uh, want to talk about the Confederation Trail and the use of ATVs on it. It's a very hot topic in our province. And I uh, don't have a lot of time to debate this, Madam Speaker. So I'm going <coughs> to use what time I have to read some of a press release that was uh, brought out yesterday by Island Trails. And the, 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 the title of their press release is Island Trails is seeking confirmation that the Confederation Trail will remain a green way. And it outlines the history of the trail. And I'm, go I'm just going to read through the first part of the press release in the time that I have. In 1989, CNR, Canadian National Railway, announced it was abandoning the railway line in Prince Edward Island. Three islanders, Don Deacon, Gordon McQueen, and Gordon McQueen, and Ian Scott, collaborated to form a new organization to build a walking and cycling trail on the old rail bed. This organization became known as P uh, Prince Edward Island Trails, Inc., or Island Trails. Island Trails is proud of what it has achieved since then, in partnership with Canada, uh, with Ca Trans Canada Trail and the government of PEI, a new world-class active transportation route was created, the Confederation Trail. Several Island Trails members played key roles, played key roles in the trail building process. Doug Murray worked first with the PEI government, sorting out land acquisitions and rebuilding the trail bed to accommodate walkers and cyclists. He also researched and designed 150 trail interpretation signs, and for those that use the trail will be familiar with these, located along the entire length of the trail. When Doug retired, he continued to work as a volunteer with Island Trails. Leo Gill followed in Doug's footsteps, and he also moved to the Island Trails board when he retired. The Confederation Trail and Island Trails both turned 30 in 2024. Oh, my son's birthday, 30 years old, and Island Trail's the same age. Initially, the Confederation Trail extended from Tignish to Elmira, a distance of 273 kilometers. But in the years that followed, the government of PEI, supported by financial contributions from Trans-Canada Trail, added a spur line from Cardigan to Georgetown, another spur line from Harmony Junction to Surrey, and yet another spur line from Emerald Junction to Borden Carlton. In 2014, thanks to $1 million donated from the Garfield Western Foundation and an additional 400,000 contribution from the, t from the Trans Canada Trail, a new trail section from Iona to Charlottetown was completed. Subsequently, a spur from Lake Verde to Pisquid River was complete completed, giving the Confederation Trail a total length of 450 kilometers. The main spine, 273, the whole trail with all the spurs, 450. The contribution from the Trans-Canada Trail exceeded $3 million over this time period, a massive gift. The $1 million gift from the Garfield Weston Foundation in 2014, however, came with some strings attached. The Weston family wanted assurances that the trail would remain a greenway into perpetuity. Um, I'm Madam Speaker, at this point, I will uh, concede time to government, and I move, seconded by the leader of the third party, that we adjourn debate on this motion. Joel Carey. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Uh, speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of fi Finance, that order number seven of the day be now read. Joel Carey. Order number seven, an act to amend the Planning Act number two, Bill number 40, order for second reading. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance. The said bill be now read a second time. Bill Carey. Bill number 40, an act to amend the Planning Act number 2, read a second time. Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I moved, seconded by the Minister of Finance that the House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall carry. Honourable Deputy Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole.
The House is now in committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be titled an act to amend the Planning Act. Um, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall I carry? Welcome. Could you introduce yourself and your title for Hanser, please? Yeah, for sure. I'm Megan Williams, Manager of Land Use Planning in the Land Division. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Minister, do you have any opening comments? Um, no, I don't. We can get right. right into it. Honorable members, is it the uh, wish of the committee uh, for a general overview or clause by clause? All right. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'll leave it to the third party. Today, um, I'm just wondering if you can tell us what initiated this bill and what the expected implications mm -hmm. to these what implications these changes will have. Um, so we received a request from several municipalities and developers, and, and a second letter from registered planners as well on initiatives they felt were needed to support the development process here on the island. Um, and so in order to address that amendment, this is one of, or sorry, address that request, this is one of the amendments that we're bringing forward. Thank you, third party. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. And I'm wondering if, um, if you've consulted with planners on PEI, and if so, what their, what their feedback was, some of the general comments that you heard. Mm -hmm. So we have planners on staff um, that work together to, um, with lawyers to, to put this amendment together. Uh, we also sent the consultation draft directly to the municipalities, and so they have planners on staff. Um, we sent it to the Federation of PEI Municipalities, we've spoken with IRAC, and then of course we have the, the public consultation period uh, for two weeks um, in a variety of places, news releases, social media, and other channels. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And so the changes only really appear to address a very small number of appeals. Um, and so I'm wondering how this, how you see this changing um, time frames for appeals. Um, it's going to provide clarity for IRAC um, when it comes to the types of appeals that they can see um, and it will give them a little bit more discretion when it comes to saying okay this is you're not considered an aggrieved person um, the appeals when they come in they won't have to go through that whole process someone will be able to look at the appeal request and say you're not considered an aggrieved person um, we're not going to consider your appeal, so that will speed up the process on that end. Lead the third party. Thank you, Chair. And forgive me if you said this or if this is an obvious thing, but how does that change from the way we do things now? What does that process look like currently? That's a good question. That's okay. Yeah, I, I don't know um, right off the top of my head. I can get back to you, though, if that's okay. Yeah. That's well, good. I think that filtering just doesn't happen because it currently says anybody who's dissatisfied. So it's basically there's no um, there's no definition of who's eligible to submit a notice of appeal. And this, while it does narrow that definition somewhat, it's still fairly broad in, in some of the groups that can also uh, be defined as a grieved person. Okay. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. And just just off that point, Minister, is that so? Before this piece of legislation, would there wouldn't be that going through process? Would that mean that everything would be heard? Like every every application that was submitted would would have a process to it? Is that? I think you're correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Leave the third party. Thank you. And. Um, Okay, I feel like that question's already been answered. So, will does IRAC still have the ability to set their own timelines on things with this? I, I think they set their own schedule, yes, and uh, we're not intending to, um, with this bill, not intending to define any uh, timelines for them. Uh, Leave the third party one more and they can come back to you. Okay, that would be great. So I'm wondering if with is in this legislation Are you trying to draw address outliers from holding? House developments up like is this going to help with anything that might get in the way of, of House like 
getting um, development going, is this gonna kind of help that process? That's the intent, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, oh. Trail Town West Road. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, you, you said that you, you sent this to IRAC. Um, can you elaborate on, on what their feedback was? Generally positive. Um, and um, yeah, uh, I would say uh, they're in favor of it. Um, I think that they recognize that they see sometimes see some frivolous appeals um, from people who couldn't shouldn't really be described as aggrieved, um, and that um, they probably recognize that um, it does hold up uh, a lot of developments, and in uh, in the case of residential developments that are delayed for years, sometimes it it certainly adds to the cost of. Of those developments, and ultimately, you know, which was passed, ultimately passed on to tenants, probably, and uh, and yeah. So generally, we had uh, had this conversation, and I think they're supportive of the uh, of the amendment. Charles and West Royalty, um, can you table their um, feedback? If we have that in written form, yeah. Charles and West Royalty. Do you have it in written form? Uh, I don't know. I don't have to look. Yeah, we'd have to uh, go back and look for that. But if it's uh, <laughs> it's something we have, we can make it available. Cheryl Town West Royalty. So we don't know that we have it? We uh, do. I don't. I only know about the personal conversation I had about this issue when I uh, went to Iraq to talk generally about um, issues of concern and learn about what they do and their work volume and other things. This was something I discussed with them personally, but as part of any cons consultation uh, on this amendment, I don't know what's on paper. Cheryl, and where's Rosie? Well, that, I, I talked to them too. Um, about, I, I think that there's an issue. I want to solve the issue too of frivolous, frivolous. And I mean, we're 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 in this, we're in that together. We we need building, we need it construction. But I just want to know is that was this something that you schedule a meeting with IROC about, and then IROC came back and said, hey, this will help, or is this just a conversation in passing? I'm just trying to figure out if we can make this stronger, better, if this is doing our intended, what it intends it to do. As, as the minister said, it was, the response that we received from them was favorable. I wasn't privy to the conversation that happened between the two of them. It's just the feedback that I received um, through um, the folks who were handling the consultation was that the feedback that we had received from, um, from Iraq was positive. Uh, we can look through the, the consultation records to see if we did get something in writing from them, and then we can table it at that time. Cheryl, thank you for your What other What other records did you receive from feedback? Would, can you table all the records about feedback for this bill, or for this amendment? I believe we received about 30 responses. Um, they should all be written, um, and we can table those responses. Uh, Charlotte, I'll show you one more and then I can put you back on the list. But we're, we just don't know if IREC's there. <laughs> so that's, 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 uh, that's a problem because it, it goes to them. So, um, and I guess just moving off of that for a second, um, what was the, I, I know I, I, I received, I think, the same letter that the minister received about, about the, the municipalities uh, coming together potentially. Um, how will this will, will this affect uh, municipality bylaws in any way or, or anything? Um, was there anything there that we need to? No, mm -hmm. it uh, it only affects um, the appeals process before IRAC. Okay. All right, uh, Summerside Wilma. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in conversation 
before the meet Matt, I had a couple questions, and I just want to clarify one thing because I have a large builder in my area that's having this problem, and I'm quite sure they're watching online right now. And uh, so going forward, if someone had a project that was about to be go, an appeal can't be put in by someone that's not directly affected. Like someone at one tip of the island can't appeal a building at the other tip once this is in? That's right. That's the purpose of this. If, you know, in theory right now, if I'm un unhappy with uh, a development that the city of Summerside has approved, I can submit a notice of appeal to IRAC and go through the entire process. So this amendment puts the onus on the appellant to, to justify that they're negatively impact, personally negatively impacted by uh, the proposed development. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just thank you for that, and just uh, that is a perfect explanation that'll satisfy satisfy a lot of people. Thank you. Uh, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I'm wondering when when the consultation was done on this bill, was it done on just this amendment, or were there was it a wider was it a wider consultation done on? It was just this amendment. Just okay. Leader of the Third Party. Um, so that was a quick turnaround. You said November 7th it went out? Yeah, there was, I think it was a two week consultation yes. period. Yeah, two weeks. Two or three weeks. Yeah. We'll be the third party. Thank you, Chair. And I'm, t do you feel that that was enough time for Islanders to contribute? With Especially because we did receive quite a bit of, like, we felt um, that the support that we received through the municipalities and through the, the Federation of PEI municipalities. Um, really did encourage us to um, to get this done as soon as possible. Um, saying that, I do have the numbers for the, the number of impressions and posts, if you would like me to read those. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the, the social media campaign, um, using the Info PEI channels, uh, X, Facebook, and LinkedIn, uh, we had 9,256 post impressions. So that's the total number of times our content was displayed. 4,764 reach, so that's the total number of unique people who saw the content, and 739 engagement, so likes, reactions, comments, shares, that sort of thing. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. Is that something that is normally tracked by government? I've never heard anyone use those numbers before. It's a great metric. I guess so. It's nice to actually have a metric. Thank you. <laughs> um, I do I do just have um, one, one just quick comment. Um, I know that, uh, in general, from what I'm hearing from planners, is that there's no real concerns with this. That, that you know, it's pretty fine. They just hope that it has the entire. They're, they're not sure about the effectiveness. They're hopeful. So, um, of course, with that, um, we can always do more. Always, yes. I'm glad you said that. Thank you, Chair. I'm good. Charles and West Rosie. Uh, thank thank you. you. How do you know how many permits have been delayed uh, by the provisions in the current law? Over, I don't know, would you have any numbers on that? Oh, I did. Like, going back, how many well, years? Well, I Cheryl Town West Royalty. Thank you. Um, last year, and then if you have that number two years before. Um, I, I, I think it's fair to say we don't have that here. We'd have to ask IRAC for that, uh, the number of appeals they receive on, uh, on building permits. Um, but, you know, you can think of one prominent example of a, uh, a large multi-unit apartment building that was proposed uh, over here a couple of years ago. And um, the developers are back with a, a new plan with uh, much more density because it only makes sense now, uh, after all of this time, to, uh, to do the project with, with more density. And it, it's, it, the costs have escalated so much between the time they proposed to do the development and a, a decision from IRAC from somebody who's not directly affected by it uh, that um, you know, it, it's an entirely different uh, financial scenario now. Cheryl, can I watch Cheryl? Yeah, and I mean, I know that some big, big builds that have been effective, have affected. But when we're when we don't have the numbers, we're trying to make 
that seems like a very simple number to be able to come to this legislature with, that, to, to know how many people and how many projects have been. And it's a good number that, that, that I think Islanders should, should know, too. And it's, uh, do you have a range of how many were done well, last year or the year before? I don't, no. I can only go by uh, you know, my own experience on city council, the city of Charlottetown, the chair of the planning board. I was aware of all of our decisions that got appealed to Iraq, and it would be somewhere in the order of two to six per year. Charlottetown by Charlotte? Yeah, and um, I, I still don't. Is, it, is that something that you can bring back to this house? I think we could, and uh, if you go on the IRAC website, all of their planning appeals are listed right there. So you can see how many planning appeals, uh, you know, I, I could pull, pull it up on my phone right now and count every one of the planning appeals for um, this year. And that Cheryl, yeah. Cheryl Tamway, Cheryl Intervention by the minister? <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't, I thought I heard something. Um, you did. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, what does in good faith mean? Because we've, you and I have talked about that for other projects, and um, who determines whether an appeal is made in good faith or not? That would be Iraq. Cheryl Tamway, Cheryl And Minister, what, what does it mean in your eyes what in good faith means? That the stated reasons for the appeal are, are in fact the real reasons for the appeal rather than using a, the appeal process for other purposes. Cheryl Tamway, Cheryl But isn't that why we have IRAC? To adjudicate uh, whether it's in good faith. Cheryl Tamway, Cheryl They're the ones making the decision, are they not? Yeah, I think they're, they're uh, empowered to make those decisions too. Cheryl Tamway, Cheryl And the reason why I ask is, um, why not include a provision that IRAC may dismiss an appeal if it is determined to be frivolous or vexatious? They can dismiss appeals. They, they often do. Cheryl Tamway, Cheryl but why not take that further? Um, why, if we just, if we, if they're making the decision, um, why not look at that? And was that something that you talked about when you consulted with them? I, I think that's what uh, this gives them the ability to do: is to make a determination um, whether um, the appellant is a an aggrieved person, and if they decide uh, that they're not, then the appeal can be dismissed. And one of those is. Um, you know, rather than an individual who's personally affected, I think the clause you're looking at is 27.1D, where it says an individual who in good faith believes the decision will adversely affect the reasonable enjoyment of the individual's property. Right, so that is the individual clause. But um, that's a determination that IRAC will make on each case. Cheryl Tamworth, Cheryl And again, I ask these questions because I want to make sure that we know what we're doing in here so that it actually works. That I want to see building projects go and I want to make sure that we haven't missed a step. Would you be open to, uh, in the future, um, we talked about this before with another piece of legislation, would you be open to um, looking at, if this doesn't have the intended consequence, would you be looking at looking at further going ahead to, to make sure that we, we get there, that, that these building permits are being, um, I, I'm just, are being, are being 100%. looked at. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Yeah. Cheryl, now what's wrong? Because there's, there's ways that, you know, if somebody from, from another place has, has a friend in another place and said, hey, put this appeal through, and you know what I mean? It just, it, it just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out ways to do that. So, no, it's, uh, it's good that the minister's, that ministers uh, look into this, and I, uh, I, I think I'm going to support this 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 uh, amendment. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Thank you. Oh, yep. Let's go through the ritual here. No, you're up. Thanks, Megan. Great job. I move the title. An act to amend the planning act number two shall carry. 
I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Madam Speaker, as chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Planning Act No. 2, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to the same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall carry. Carry. Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that the first order of the day be now read. Shall carry. Carry. Order number one, consideration of the capital estimates in committee. Oh, Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move, seconded by the Minister of Finance, that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Shall we carry? Okay. Deputy Speaker, please chair committee to hold. The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes, please. Shall I carry? Yeah. Introduce yourself and your title for Hansers. Jordan McNally, Executive Director of Fiscal Management. Welcome. Minister, do you have any opening comments or anything you would like to uh, table? I feel like my opening comments were probably done yesterday. I suspect so. <laughs> I won't waste everyone's time, um, but I do have a document to table. All right, uh, the clerk will get copies to everybody. So we uh, are going to start on page five, capital expender agriculture. Equipment and other capital assets, appropriations provided for information technology, system modernization and equipment purchases. Equipment, 50,000. IT system modernization, 78,100. Total equipment and other capital assets, 128,100. Uh, Erie and Burness. Uh, yeah, Minister, just on uh, capital assets, uh, 128000 not a significant amount by any means, but uh, can give me some sense on that equipment. Uh, I see the IT modernization, but my understanding was is that the Agriculture Insurance Corporation had a request in for uh, 
uh, some supports for uh, vehicles and things of that nature because they're they're out traveling quite a bit and we're going to hopefully be adding a price insurance program into the agriculture insurance corporation so uh, am i going with the assumptions you're going to continue to pay mileage to the insurance representatives on this or if there's no money for vehicles yeah so agriculture insurance corporation is a a crown corp that okay. is outside of the appropriation vote that we currently allow for. So okay, so they don't fall under the capital budget in any capacity? No, currently they don't. The, the appropriation vote is just for departments um, and certain crown corporations like housing corporation or innovation PEI is another example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there, I think there is some more work there to be done to determine what the policy is on vehicles versus mileage, um, but yeah. It's, it's not in this capital budget. O'Leary and Verdes? So how do I find out whether they are doing that or not? Is it just simply a question to the legislature? Or is it, the, how, I mean, in these third-party organizations that are kind of funded really by government, or supported by government, anyway? Yeah, I'm, I can't I think speak. question period would be a good place <laughs> to do that, absolutely. O'Leary and Verdes? Okay, no, that's fine. I just, I just, I guess I was thinking it was, still would go under capital budget if those organizations, uh, like the Grain Elevator Corporation would be another one, you know, in, the, in their capital development projects that they would do. So they they're basically don't deal with the legislature. And I think that is something that they're working on. Like I know I had a chat with my deputy minister because I was seeing that there were a few, what's included in the capital budget, what isn't. So that is something that they're looking at. Okay. But uh, of course a lot of those things are still going through um, you know, expenditures over a certain amount still go through Treasury Board. There's still certainly oversight by government. But, hmm. um, well, maybe I will have another. <laughs> so, so, what well, Larry and Vernes. So, would Tourism PEI be another one of these ones that the, nothing goes through the capital budget through them? No, they are through the capital budget through uh, Department of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport, and Culture. Uh, now you're confused me. So they they are they do, but. But the Agriculture Insurance Corporation or Grain Elevator does not. Yeah, government actually owns the tours and PEI assets. Um, so that's why the appropriation goes to the department rather than tours and PEI itself. Okay. Well, Larry and Brett. Just to follow up, so then who owns the PEI Grain Elevator Corporation and the Agriculture Insurance Corporation? So I'll just, I'll just stop here because <laughs> I think... This could probably go on for a while, and what's what's before us is the capital expenditure for agriculture, right? Yeah. That's what we're discussing right now. I think you have valid points. I'm not <laughs> like, and I think that is a discussion for another day. But I think right now before us is, unless I'm wrong, this is what we're discussing right now, right? That's right. Okay. Over in Venice. Well, I certainly don't want to be difficult about it, but no. but I guess I'm still saying so. The the province owns certain. Uh, organizations, corporations, under, and it falls under agriculture. If I'm asking a question in the legislature, I have to ask the Minister of Agriculture, but yet I can't ask questions on, uh, on the capital budget pertaining to an agricultural uh, corporation that's responsible under the Department of Agriculture. So, you know, I, I just sort of say I would like to see, as a minister responsible for uh, the capital budget, that you set a policy that has some continuity within all of the different uh, entities that, that the government is responsible for. If I use the argument, and I didn't really look in this, but health PEI, so is there nothing, nothing under health PEI under here? I'm kind of guessing there probably is. So the, the, what, what inconsistencies could be more than that? <laughs> right? So anyway, I, I'll, I'll drop the question on that. But uh, you know, I, I think I hope my points are it's valid. A good point. It okay. is a good point. Thank, Thank you, honorable member. Thanks, uh, Chair. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. I'm poor agriculture. It's it's the first one in the book, and it's not a big expenditure. We're looking at three hundred and yeah. something million dollar thing, but um, I, and so we tend to have energy and time to focus on the first things. But the, there are some important things to to talk about here. I see that in the budget here, there's money set aside to buy some ATVs, and I'm wondering um, how many you plan to acquire over the next few years. Yeah. The, the, the plan for next year is for two all-terrain vehicles. New Haven Rocky Point? Right. I'm, uh, I don't know, but how much does an ATV run to these days? 20 grand. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not sure the cost breakdown between the two ATVs, but that's okay. what's in their plan for okay. for 24-25. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. And I see. So the 50,000 is a recurring thing, and a f forever I've, I remember agriculture is $50,000, but we're at, we have some extra expenditures this time, and it's on that IT system. Can you tell us a bit about that and what it's going to accomplish? Yeah. So agriculture has a bunch of programs that they run. Um, and uh, ECRM uh, basically allows for one central repository for client information across various programs. So it's a way that um, they can track that client information a little bit better centrally. Okay. Yeah. All right. Jim. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Um, so compared to the last capital budget, um, it w this department was agriculture and land. Now it's agriculture, and I'm wondering, um, given the loss of uh, responsibility, wh whether we will the, the funding doesn't seem to have gone down at all. So was there no funding associated with the land portion of the department previously? Yeah, most of the the land portion would have been vehicles for like inspection officers, which would, um, if they were new additions, they'd fall under the department, but then. Uh, essentially be owned by DTI as part of the light fleet. Uh, okay, sure. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks. Um, so we, I mean, we're all aware of the, our changing climate and how that impacts various parts of our lives and economy and communities, but an agriculture is clearly one where that happens a lot. Um, is there anything in this capital budget to support, um, and I'm thinking here specifically about uh, greenhouses, as our growing season expands, and that's one of the few silver linings that we have here related to climate change, is there money being set aside to take advantage of that and expand our growing season here by providing grants, for example, for um, greenhouses? Um, if it was a grant program, it would fall under the operating budget. Okay. Uh, so there's nothing in this capital budget for like government-owned greenhouses. Okay. Um, the only thing that comes to mind is under the Department of Environment for the expansion of the, the Goody uh, Nursery. Um, I have to look into what was involved with that expansion, but no, for a grant program, it wouldn't fall under capital. Yeah. New Haven, Rocky Point. Yeah, I was thinking of, of new new uh, uses for greenhouses and small, well, and, and large farmers use them. Um, final question. Uh, I asked the, uh, the minister yesterday, I think, or maybe two days ago, about uh, the la uh, land bank initiative. Um, would that fall under th this section, or would that be uh, um, under housing and land, if there's any capital expenses associated with that? Um, or transportation, would it be? There, it, uh, sorry, it might depend on uh, what land bank program. So there's um, the buffer zone buyback program. Right. Mm -hmm. That falls under environment. Right. Yeah. Um, and then land purchases, like for protection of, of land, uh, Ducks Unlimited, that, that kind of partnership yeah. that would fall under the Department of Transportation. Right. Yeah. Okay. New Haven, Rocky Point. And I guess because we can't find it here and perhaps not elsewhere, as the minister said later, maybe that program is now not going to happen, but there's nothing in this department anyway related to that. Yeah. No. Okay. I'm good with this for this section. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Total capital expenditure agriculture one hundred twenty-eight thousand one hundred shall carry. Capital improvements, buildings, appropriations provided for capital improvements and construction. Uh, my apologies, we're now in education and early years. Uh, capital repairs four million, construction and renovations forty-five million eight hundred eighty-eight thousand. Slemon Park uh, Record Center expansion nil. Total capital improvements, uh, buildings, 49,888,000. Any questions? The leader of the third party. So we had $4 million budgeted last year, and we overspent by almost a million. I'm wondering if you can tell us why we don't expect to spend that higher amount, the $4.9 million, this coming year. Um, For the, the, yeah, so... There, there was pressures last year that last year's budget was uh, 4.7. Uh, 
including all all capital repairs, which would have been uh, ceiling tile replacements. Um, so there was a, a bit of pressure with cost escalations in that specific project, which would have bumped that up a bit. Um, the department uh, is allocated, it's just under the next line, construction and renovations, um, six million for the new uh, school revitalization fund. That's, um, it's a similar type thing. It's um, it's capital repairs and renovations. The, you can kind of view both lines similarly, but um, there is a bump up mm -hmm. of six million overall, and that would be to address catching up on some capital repairs, or if there are larger um, capital repairs that can't fit under that four million. So you can if you look at it that way. It's it's really a ten million dollar uh, allocation. Leader third party. Thank you, Chair. I know, I'm wondering if you can give us a list of, of schools and projects that are slated to be repaired this year. Yeah. Um, and these would be um, more on the major capital repairs. Um, there's, so there's, um, on the major capital repairs, we're talking Georgetown, Elliott River, Montague Consolidated. Um, those would be projects that are upcoming in, in the fiscal year. Um, some of them are actually going to be completed this upcoming fiscal year, but those are the, the major capital repair projects. Lead the third priority. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we know obviously there's a lot of repairs needed across the province in a lot of schools, and I'm just wondering what the total value um, of repairs that have been identified as necessary. I wouldn't have the total dollar value. I know that um, as part of the public schools branch's letter of priorities to the department, they list uh, quite a few um, repairs that are, are needed, but they don't set a dollar value. Really, that would be determined if the project was set to go ahead. Um, they, they would have a cost at that point of what it would be. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, and so, when do we have an idea of when these repairs would happen? They wouldn't happen during the school year. They would happen. The ones that you have slated will happen in the summertime, so it doesn't disrupt the school year. Yeah, like the major school capital repairs that I kind of listed those <laughs> projects. Um, they are major school re capital repairs, and they're not allowed to occur during s the school season. So they would happen during the summer. Some repairs, you know if they're minor in nature under that capital repairs bucket or the new school revitalization fund, um, they might be able to occur during school. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, personally what the parameters of that to determine it, but I know they could happen during school. Yeah. Okay. Leader third party. Thank you, Chair, and this might be going off the, the capital budget train a bit, so just let me know if it is, but I'm wondering about safety processes in place if there's construction happening during the school year, is there any, um, is there any significant cost to the province to ensure student safety? Um, I don't think it's separated in terms of costing. I know there, there it would form part of the project itself, um, and that would be included in the cost estimates, especially for a major school capital repair. Uh, well, I guess you're talking about repairs that would happen during school. Um, so it, it's, it wouldn't be something that's tr tracked separately, but it would be a cost if you're, if you're putting up things. Yeah. Uh, honorable members, if we could all just speak up just a little bit so Hanser could hear us correctly. And Leo, the third party, one more, and then I can put you back on the list. Yep, that's great. Thank you. So looking at the Georgetown project is at $2.1 million, and the school was built in 1954 and therefore likely has asbestos in its walls. Will these renovations be completed while students are in the school, or would that be over summer break? I believe that one's wrapping up, is it not? It's just wrapping up, actually. Just wrapping up. I think this one would happen outside of uh, school year. Um, Something we can look into. Yeah, I actually have it here. So it? it would take place in the summer of 2024 and 2025. Yeah. Cheryl, Town, what's your Uh Thank you very much. Um, just 
I guess I'll start with the school ventilation upgrades. We talked about that and we talked about 10 schools uh, which needed to be upgrades. And then in the, in the notes, it said work began in 2021-22 and is expected to be completed in 24-25. Then the next line said project was expected to be completed in 23-24 but has been delayed due to an industry capacity. But it, is it still delayed? I think there's two tenders out <coughs> on two projects that they just haven't been able to get bids on. I think Vernon yeah. River is one of them. They, they've had trouble sourcing bids on, the, on these projects. Um, I do have a breakdown of the schools and their percentage of completion. Or complete, that okay, be perfect. Cheryl, can I watch Shirley? Um, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take those. Uh, well, if you're going to... Yep, I can run through the list, so... Um, may not line up in the order of the way you have them in your sheet, but West Kent is substantially complete. St. Jean is in progress 60% complete, so that's estimated in the fall of 2024 to be completed. Cardigan, 70% complete, again, fall 2024. Alberton and O'Leary, they're substantially complete. Belfast is in progress, 70% complete. Inglewood, um, that's one that's um, expected more in the winter of 2024. Um, Parkdale was tendered with no bids, so it was reposted in early November. Vernon River, again, tendered with no bids, reposted in November 2nd, so it's out for bids. And uh, Parkside is going to be complete in 2024 as well. Charles, how so did it only, did those two schools, because Parkdale and, and Vernon River, did those two schools go out for bid more than once? Parkdale and Vernon River, um, my understanding is they went out for bids once and had no bids, so they've, they've resubmitted the bid a second time. Cheryl, can I wish Cheryl to? Is it, is it um, on the 10 schools thus far, is that, has that been done by numerous different companies? I don't have the details of which companies did which project. Cheryl, do you know I just want to ask if you can, Minister, can you guarantee that those last two schools at least get started or get going, but I guess that's kind of impossible. Well, I think they're trying. Yeah, um, um, yeah I, I don't know what else you can do except to repost a tender. Uh, one more, Cheryl, do you know and then I can move on. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess I, I guess I just maybe urge the minister. And I know you're trying. I know it's everything's there, but this is important. And this was, I guess, brought on by you know, by reports and COVID. We've talked a lot about it in here. Um, when is uh, when does that tender close? And um, is it is it is it open right now? And um, I know it was reposted November second. I don't know. I don't have the close date in my notes, but it, it would be a public tender, so it would be on the government tender website yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Back to uh, list. So, or uh, Rusty Go Almeros. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my questions are about the school revitalization program, and uh, I know one of the things when I was minister of education, I found that so much money was always allocated to the big projects that none of the, the small, you know, I call it client facing stuff, student facing, teacher facing, ever ever got to it. And things like just painting the entranceway in the school, maybe minor remodeling, replacing railings that were dated, um, this sort of thing. Sometimes there were washrooms that had gaps in the stalls that just needed to be replaced, or the mirrors, the silver was flaking off them. Other cases, you might have a music room like a Gulf Shore Consolidated School that didn't have a sink and they just wanted a sink, but they could never make it up on the priority list. Mm -hmm. Is that the purpose of the school revitalization program? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really to, uh, to, well, it'd be between the school, it'd be up to the school board to prioritize what, what's being done. But yeah, the intent is basically to catch up on capital repairs that need to be done. Um, so whether that will move those type of projects further up on the list um, is yet to be determined. But that is the intent, is basically that more capital repairs can be done from their list of priorities. Rush to go, Admiral. Well, and thank you. That that was my next question. I, I wanted to know if it was indeed the elected school board representatives with the various school boards that would would be doing the prioritization based on feedback by groups like the home and school associations and the, and of course the the teachers and administration themselves at the schools. Uh, that sounds that it's right, correct? 
yeah, basically the parameters of the, the fund is that it's anything that can't be uh, accomplished through their existing four million capital repairs fund, but wouldn't be so large as a major capital uh, project kind of thing, like a, a, an expansion, for example. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, that's Rustico a- Rustico Emerald. So, thank you, Chair. Just want to say thank you. That's a, that's a great program. It was one that I was pushing for while I was minister, and it's nice to see it uh, formalized. Thank you very much. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to ask some questions about Elliott River, not actually in my district, but many of my uh, my constituents have kids that go there. Um, I see that there's a million dollars there to complete, and that's going to be in 2024, but the construction began in 2021. I'm just, I, I'm wondering whether it was originally scheduled to take that long. Um. I can't speak to when the original completion date was. Um, I know with it only occurring during the summer months, it, it's a challenge to go any faster. Um, but I, I know the total project cost is expected to be 14.2 million. Started in the summer 2021, finalized in the summer 2024. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair. Cornwall, I mean, there's a lot of fast growing communities on PEI, but. I, I think Cornwall is the, either the fastest or one of the one of the fastest growing communities, and I'm wondering whether I, what, does this handout would, would, would this include um, new classrooms? I like all of the renovations would include additions of new classrooms, presumably in construction. Uh, it depends on the project. Like Elliott River, for example, specifically included a 7,000 square foot addition. Okay. Um, whereas, as some projects. Uh, may just have a, they're a large capital project that, that didn't necessarily need an expansion. Um, one that comes to mind is uh, Georgetown, for example. I don't believe, I don't believe there's an expansion component to that. It was just the need for quite a few renovations within the school. I'm, I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, George. Shall the sec uh, Cheryl, can I wish royalty? Yeah, but um, just some questions about um, <clears throat> Queen Charlotte. So, in in the in the minister's mandate letters, it says take immediate steps to alleviate space pressures at Queen Charlotte. But here it says work expected to be completed by 2027. Is that is that immediate? Well, I, I think it's as, as immediate as you get in construction these days. I mean, there would have to be a, a planning process in there, too. Um, engineering, design, um, and then the construction, right? So. Cheryl, do you Cheryl So I'll take that maybe as, as a no. And um, with capital projects, it is if you're talking about mobiles, we, there was talking here about mobiles, about the stu school needing mobiles, or, or they were in desperate need. The, the whole thing, it, it's a very, it's a very old school. It's a well-used school. There's a lot of kids there. Would mobiles be in the capital budget too, or is any type of thing? In, yeah. Yes. Cheryl, oh sorry, Minister, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, there's. Uh, it was a specific request from the public schools branch for a uh, million dollars to buy four mobiles. Um, which would be used for kind of immediate pressures at various schools. So I can't speak to where they're going to be placed, but there is a million dollars next year to purchase four mobiles. Yeah. Cheryl, how much royalty? So there's a, a million dollars to purchase four mobiles that we don't have currently. There's there, Those mobiles are not here. We've gotten mobiles before, and um, they've been set up at West Royalty. Um, did Queen Charlotte get mobiles? Under the last year's capital budget, I have to relate it back. No, there, there's no model walls like currently in, at Queen Charlotte. Um, there is other mobiles out in the school system that are being used uh, or have been attached to schools, but none of them are currently available. So, you know, this would be the source additional mobiles to go and wherever the priority areas are. Mm -hmm. Cheryl Town West Royalty. Um, <clears throat> the initial plans will start next year. That's an easy thing to put in there. 
But I look at Queen Charlotte, there's no backyard, there's no front yard, there's a parking lot that just got paved. We had problems with that too, because a lot of my constituents go there, it was paved late. There's only one where to go. Like, how, how, do we, how do we know that the planning, like, how do we know that we can invest $17 million? There's, there's I don't know where, I don't know where the, it's, it's gonna go. To have $17 million project completed by 26, 27, starting now, I, I would consider that really good turnaround in construction of that magnitude. Um, but, you know, having sat on a planning and construction committee for the Stratford School, you can see, you know, they want to consult with teachers that work in the school. They want to make sure that the allocation of space is done properly and that adjacencies are done well so that there's good flow within that additional space. So there's a lot of consideration there um, from staff um, and others um, to Charles be taken into account. Sorry, Minister. Sorry. Charles Sorry. Charles Great. So then that, that I, I agree, and, and that's, that's futuristic. But in the short term, when you said that, that there's $1 million for four mobiles, and this is an immediate pressure, um, there's still an opportunity. Things get delayed all the time in this industry, as we just found out here. Are those mobiles, are any of them going to Queen Charlotte? We don't have the uh, member has said already that he's unaware of where they're going. I would assume that that's public schools branch would make that decision, right? <clears throat> yeah. So, that's something we give we give them the money through this budget process and it's under their oversight of you know where they're going to put them Shot was really one more up yeah on. sure but the mandate letter of the minister is is it says the word immediate and so I, I'm asking questions to you and then you're saying it's the PSB's decision how do I know that that's going to get done immediately there the, the, the school the sc there's so many kids at the school right now it needs immediate help how do I, how do I as a member get that reassurance? Well, you could, you could, the, the money's there, the mobiles are being bought, the, the money's been allocated, planning to have this completed by 26, 27, a $17 million project. That's good, turn, that's, that's good turnaround, that's getting done quick. Um, but yeah, how do you know? I, I would say, you know, talk to the public schools branch and the, and the new board, because it would be their decision. Our four. job is to put the money in, in there for them. Lead to the third party. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm looking at the Montague Consolidated, where it says uh, $100,000 to complete, and that the majority of the, the, the project would be substantially completed by winter 2023, which was last winter. So I'm wondering what's, what's left or what the holdup there is. Uh, winter 2023 would would be this coming winter, so it's expected to be done be done this winter. Um, the 100k for next year is really just uh, what they call like the deficiency phase. If there's anything after the renovations are complete that needs to be addressed, that's what that 100k is for. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. So in case something else comes up, is that what you just said? Yeah, it's usually a, there's a small period after construction where the, the school is ready to be fully utilized, but um, there may be something that's throughout the walkthrough that needs to be addressed, and it's called like a deficiency phase where the contractor needs to come back in to correct a small issue that was left over. Leave the third priority. Thank you, Chair. So when do we expect that project to be completed? Uh, the department provided us with the details that it would be winter 2023, so like this, this winter. Lead the third party. Okay, thank you. Um, so the school ventilation upgrades, um, two million dollars in twenty four twenty five, and so this work's only done in summer months. I'm wondering what's the difference between these renovations and other re renovations that we do all year long. Um. To me, it would be the fact that the ventilation systems run throughout the, the school, so it, it, it affects multiple areas of the school. Um, whereas if you're maybe replacing a boiler or something that's contained outside of the learning area, that, that could be maybe replaced during school. 
whereas ventilation kind of runs throughout the school, so it would be larger. Yeah. Leader the third priority. Thank you, Chair. And so there are 10 schools which need immediate upgrades to the ventilation systems to meet the current standards. And I know um, work was supposed to have begun on this a long time ago, so I'm surprised that that many of the schools are still on this list. So um, I'm wondering uh, which which of these 10 schools have been completed? Yeah, so that list is all of the 10 schools, not just the ones that are left to be completed. So um, I, I kind of ran through the list with um, another member there, but uh, West Kent is complete, or substantially complete. Alberton, O'Leary, um, those, those are substantially complete. Others are in partial completion or Again, tenders went out again because they had no bids on the, on the tender. Leave the third party. Thank you, Chair. But does does that take the ventilation system, if it's not complete, does that take the ventilation system out of commission? Like, are there schools currently operating without a ventilation system? I, I don't have the details to speak to that, to be honest, how that works in terms of the ventilation system. We could find out and get that to you. Leader of the third party. I'd really appreciate that information. I think that that, I mean, that's whew, cause for alarm if if those if there are schools without ventilation systems right now. So I'd really appreciate that that information back. Um, and and you have already said I've already heard you say that you weren't sure which schools would be getting the temporary classrooms. I'm wondering if that's something that you can take back, or is that something that you leave in the hands of the public schools branch? Yeah, because it's a purchase next year. Um, it's certainly not information um, that, that we have at this at this point. Um, I can see what the department can, can bring back on that, though. Okay. Leader of the third party? Yeah, okay, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so under construction and renovations, there's a large underspend in the current fiscal year, over $10 million. And I'm wondering what projects were plan that were planned did not get completed or started. Um, so one of the projects under that is Montague Consolidated, um, which is wrapping up in the current fiscal year. And that actually came in under budget. Um, Another, another under underspend or delayed spending is Sherwood School replacement, um, and as you can imagine, in larger school projects, um, timing can swing quite a bit, um, especially with projects like Sherwood School or or Stratford School. So Stratford is another one um, that was coming in forecasting to be under their budget. Um, it's not that the total project is under budget. It's just the, the delay in timing of, of when um, when the expenditures oh, yeah. are actually spent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, really. <laughs> Saved by the bell. Thank you, members. <laughs> Do that again. <laughs> Do you call? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? Yeah. All right, I got it. Madam Speaker, as chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of capital supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Well, Carrie. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and Government Whip. The member from Summerside, Wilmont, that this House do recess until Thursday, November the 23rd at 1 o'clock.
Bill Carey. Bill Carey. Have a good evening, everyone.